Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. Uh, this episode was recorded on Saturday, November 16th, 2019, starting at 3.53 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the 230th episode of the show. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with astrologer Jessica Lignato about adapting relationship astrology to modern times. For more information about how to subscribe to the podcast and help support the production of future episodes by becoming a patron, please visit theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. Hey, Jessica, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me on episode 230. What an accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm excited. This is actually your second appearance. I don't remember what episode number it was, but it was probably like 100 episodes ago when we talked about um, like the, the sudden rise in popularity of astrology like a year or two ago, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. It was in the 100s somewhere. What a yeah. great problem to have to be like, was it in the 100s or 150s? <laughs> it's exciting. Right. Well, what I also love about that is now with you coming back, you're back and part of the occasion for this is uh, you have a new, you're one of several uh, major uh, younger generations of astrologers that has a new book coming out by like a major publisher this time. Um, and it's actually on relationship astrology. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that today. And uh, first, just say congratulations for that because that's kind of a big, big deal. Thank you so much. I also want to thank you for referring to me as a younger generation as I sit here in middle age. Right. Uh, <laughs> I still I appreciate being counted as one of the younger generations of astrologers. <laughs> yeah, I love that that's still the case. That's been the burden for like a generation or two, like a Pluto generation or two. Basically, like anybody under Pluto and Leo. Yeah. They're still considered like a young astrologer if you're like yeah. under your you're under your 60s or 70s or 80s at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, and honestly, that's that's fair. I mean, astrology is nothing if it's not the study of time and age. So I think, I mean, I'll take it. I'll be a young astrologer in my mid 40s. That's cool. I'm down. Sure. Yeah. Right. Totally. <laughs> All right. Excellent. So uh, you are the host of the popular Ghost of a Podcast. Uh, which has become super popular over the course of the past year. When, when did you start it? It was not that long ago, right? Not that long ago. It's uh, it's a weekly show, and I think I'm on episode 73. So it's uh, maybe a year and a couple months old now. It's still pretty, still in in its early years. Hopefully. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, one of my first exposures to your work was several several years ago. And I talked about it. I believe it was in episode eighty-three when I did an episode with Ian Weisler about the Queer Astrology Conference, where you did a talk with Barry Perlman um, about. It was titled in the paper, at least, uh, "Queer Talk on Client Work," and that was one of my favorite uh, papers in that compilation when they published like the compilation of papers afterwards. And it seemed to be part of like an ongoing theme in your work, which is um, adapting. Relationship astrology and adapting astrology in general to the sort of sensibilities of modern times, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and thank you also. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that I think is going to be the central sort of question and premise of this discussion or this episode. We'll get into a little bit of a QA about relationship astrology where people have sent in some questions later. Uh, but first, I wanted to talk a bit about um, this as the central sort of proposition, which is. Um, I think that astrology is always a reflection of the culture, the social sensibilities, and the time period in which it's practiced. So then one of my questions that I want to address today is, in what ways then did relationship astrology need to change recently in order to adapt it to the sensibilities of practitioners living in modern Western times? And I feel like you're a really good person to talk to about that because I get a sense that that's something that you've been doing, and that's a large part of what your work has been about. And I was curious, to what extent is that a conscious thing that you're doing, or to what extent is that just a natural, a thing that comes naturally to you because you're working with real life individuals and doing consultations all the time, and so you have to make the astrology adapt to what is appropriate to them rather than. You know what was appropriate to clients like two thousand years ago or something like that. Yeah, um, you know it's it's both. I mean, it's very conscious and it's also very organic to who I am and my take on the world. And um, my work as an astrologer is very much like um, a counseling session, and I'm really interested in using astrology as a way to uh, provide tools for individuals that are usable and that start with people from wherever they're starting at. And so my, you know, 
and, and this is something I've, I've said in public before, but like when I first started studying astrology in the early 1990s, I would take a pen to all of my books and I would write, it would be like, he this, he that. And I would just put a little S in front of it because it was driving me nuts because I was like, you're not talking about me. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, as a queer person, I discovered astrology around the same time where I realized I was gay. And I was really just deeply disheartened by the lack of um, flexibility in everything I was reading or most everything I should say that I was reading. And the idea of gender, the idea of um, of sexuality, but also of race and class um, and ability, all of these things um, have not been effectively uh, reflected in astrology, unfortunately. And that's, I think, for a lot of reasons. But for me, taking a step back from what the kind of like old school people tell me to think about the the planets or the signs or the aspects or whatever I'm working with and using very intentionally the data around the energy of what any of these things mean and Mm -hmm. adapting it to a situation, uh, like a real life situation, is really how I use astrology. And so the way that I use astrology is not, I'm not the most technical astrologer. I think um, in terms of like technical know-how, I'm not the best astrologer. But in terms of translating it into human terms and meeting people where they're at and counseling them in such a way that I can um, give them tools that are actionable, that's where I'm really excellent. And Mm -hmm. that is um, something I've trained myself in doing um, over the course of many years. And, um, and, And I should say, you know, it's not specific to my book at all, but um, for me, looking at immigration patterns, um, race, ethnicity, class, those things are as integral as any of this relationship, gender, sexuality stuff, because it's about looking at the whole human and understanding the social context that a human is relating to themselves from, relating to others from. So maybe that was a long answer to your question, but hopefully it answered your question. No, that, that was perfect. And um, part of the context is you're from Montreal, Canada, right? Yes, indeed. Bien uh, sir, be- as we say. <laughs> but you live in um, in San Francisco? Um, I'm in Oakland now, but I was in San Francisco for like 20 years. Yeah. 20 years. Okay. So mm-hmm. that was kind of like the culture, the sort of context in which you came up as an astrologer for the most part. Absolutely. And I should also say that I'm from refugees on both sides. So, um, you know, my mom was the firstborn to Holocaust survivors uh, like a year after they uh, they ended up in Canada. Um, and, uh, and then my dad, he himself is uh, a refugee. And so um, having this perspective on looking at uh, culture and the need to adapt to a dominant culture um, is something that was a big part of my consciousness before I discovered feminism or came out as gay or any of that sort of stuff. And again, I think that's where a lot of these kind of like intersectionalities become really important to me and are a big part of how I taught myself astrology. Sure. Um, yeah, because what we were talking about earlier in terms of going through your books and and like crossing out when it's always addressed to like the the male is in the delineations. I mean, that's something that goes back when you're reading most ancient texts, like from the second century, and they're giving delineations for stuff. It usually is presented with the assumption that the reader is a male or that you're doing the consultation for a male, and then at the end, uh, they'll just be like a digression, and it'll say and. You know, similarly for women, if you're doing the interpretations of women, it's sort of like an afterthought in some of those older texts. You get to modern times, like the 20th century, and eventually we start seeing um, female astrologers and the the consultations and clientele of astrologers certainly becomes more clearly defined as women in the 20th century, uh, and uh, female astrologers start becoming more dominant voices in in the community in general. But even uh, in the 1970s and stuff, where you start seeing books, they're clearly like pushing some of the boundaries and changing astrology and adapting it to the cultural sensibilities of the 1970s. But there's still a lot of voices there that got left out and were were not included in things that look very dated. If you read like a sinistry book from the 1970s or something, I think absolutely, yeah. I mean, and and even within that, I mean, it was mainly white astrologers when they were women, and they were mainly straight. Um, and the in order to get published by an actual publisher, you had to appeal to a male ear and a male perspective. And the great democratizer of the internet has changed that. And um, and you know, I think it's so wonderful, and I think it's so 
dynamic. And, you know, also there are some things we could speak very critically <laughs> about when it comes to the internet and how it's democratized astrology. But, um, but in the context of giving more diverse voices, um, kind of a mic, uh, it, it's really valuable. It's really valuable. Definitely. Yeah. Um, all right. So with that in mind, that's kind of how you approach. You, you, your book is coming out, and the title is uh, what is the title of the book again? Sure, it's Astrology for Real Relationships: Understanding You, Me, and How We All Get Along. But you have to say it in that tone, otherwise you yeah. can't read the book. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, totally. gonna, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to work on that. <laughs> You're gonna uh, have to work on your delivery for sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um. So that was was that kind of the the perspective that you approached this book from in terms of. You know, it's time to write a book about relationships, but to make it relevant in 2019. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, I really do believe that relationships are an opportunity to show up. And so, in order to be in a healthy and effective relationship, you need to show up. And people love to focus on like, their Venus is in this and their Mercury is that. And, you know, and that's, there's a value to it. But really, what I'm interested in is addressing um, the nuance of relationships and the nuance of one's relationship to ourselves um, so that we can understand that we are the foundation of all of our relationships and all of your relationships are found in your birth chart. You don't have to look at your crush's birth chart or your lover's birth chart to know what's going on in your relationship. You have to look at your own because what you consent to, what you participate in is, is your chart. And so for me, the book is hopefully an opportunity to teach some of my perspective and in how I use astrology. And again, the way I use astrology is very simple. It's a lot of repetition of fundamentals and a deepening and deepening and deepening of those fundamentals, because I think that is what is most effective. Also, I'm a triple Capricorn, so of course I think that. Um, but I, um, I have the hope to have this book as a re resource for a kind of wide array of relationships and for both a deepening of an individual reader's relationship to themselves as well as to others. And so that I just dropped something, sorry. Um, sorry. But so that they can have more effective relationships. That's really, that's that's my goal. And the book itself um, is feminist, absolutely, in its approach, um, which is to say it does not center maleness. It doesn't center femaleness. It centers humanity. Um, and it is queer inclusive. Um, I, you know, I understand in writing the book that when I'm looking at long-term relationships, not all relationships are monogamous, not all relationships are straight, some people are ace, um, some people are queer, not all people are men and women, there are many, many genders. So there's like a lot of that stuff um, is in the forefront of my mind when I was writing this book um, and whenever I work with astrology. So yeah. Yeah, and and that's just like completely different from where somebody in like 1970 was coming from when they were writing a book on on relationships. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Even the 1990s. I mean, this is a a really. Um, I, I think that again, the internet can be credited for a lot in terms of our ability to be intersectional and develop language. Because in the 1990s, when I was living in San Francisco in a very queer community, the language that we used to define ourselves, to um, identify our gender, stuff like that. Um, you had to either live in that community or read the books that were published by people in that community in order to have access to our language. Now, people can use hashtags, they can post stuff on social, and it has a global impact. And that is so interesting to see how we can self-define in new ways and then share it in a global way instantly. So small um, small movements can become global movements kind of organically and quickly. So that that is a really new thing. And I think it is reflected in, certainly in my work, um, and I think it's reflected in a lot of astrologers' works, new new up-and-coming astrologers. And and I have had old uh, older astrologers um, consult with me to ask me questions about gender issues and sexuality issues and feminism. And I love that. I respect that. I, I want us all to kind of be interested in the evolution of language and of what equality means, you know? And um, so, yeah, it, it's, I'm, I'm going on a tangent, but there it is. That's, that's some stuff I'm excited about. Yeah, I love that. And to take it back to a point you were making earlier where, you know, relationship astrology is not just all about looking at synastry or comparing charts, and there's many different types of relationships. And I love that that's sort of a fundamental point that you approach the book from because you divided the book up into three sections where you're dealing with different types of relationships, basically, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, the first section is friends and chosen family, because for a lot of us, our family of origin isn't our family. It's like our community of chosen people. Um, Mm -hmm. And also I think platonic love is incredibly important and platonic relationships are incredibly important. And this kind of like old school heteronormative idea that like you have friends until you get married and then you get married and you drop your friends or your friends are like, just like the supportive thing to your primary relationship. It's an outdated way of living. I, I I don't think it's, I mean, if that's how you choose to live, that's cool, but I'm happy to support through astrology people in choosing to focus on their friendships. And then the second section is hooking up and early stages of dating, like the first three months. Cause so many mm. astrology books, you're just like, you just open the book and it's like, this is how you will be in a relationship. And it's like, well, right. what is a relationship? Is it six months, three months, a year? Um, right. And so this is kind of like the TBD, what's actually happening here? Are we dating? Are we not dating? Like, is it going to work out stage? And also the Netflix and chill stage. It's the, like, sure. I'm not trying to date this person, but I'm also not trying to ruin my life. What's astrology have to say? And then the third right. section is long-term relationships, like the more conventional love stuff. So try to cover it all. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, that's covering like a huge swath of like ground of just about everything because astrology is so broad. And that's sometimes one of the difficult things is it can o- almost be overly broad and like hard to deal with, especially for newer students sometimes. So I agree, having yeah. st- something that's giving you a cross section of all of those different types of relationships in your life is very like useful. That's that's my hope. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really into the utility of astrology. And again, this is where um, in my kind of use and approach with astrology, I'm a I and this is something that is not what I see a lot of young, <laughs> new astrologers doing. When when you start learning astrology, you get so excited and you're like, I want to learn all the things. I want to learn progress this and like you want to just learn all these tools because all these tools right. are so exciting and you hear someone else using it and you're like jealous. You want to be able to do that magic, but the reality is, if you can't do the basics, then you're going to have all these gaps in your ability to actually make sense and synthesize and utilize. Uh, the astrology that you're learning. And so I am really focused on planets because I really believe the repetition of fundamentals, understanding on a really deep uh, level what the planets do and what they don't do, what they govern and what they don't govern in practical terms, that will tell you everything you need to know. And then the general nature of astrology becomes a lot less general because it is... um, I guess, essentially, it's just energy and being able to understand that, you know, certain kind of energy runs in certain directions and other energy runs in a different direction. It's actually gets much, it gets more specific when you have a clear question, um, which is maybe a whole other topic, that clear question uh, topic. But yeah, um, my hope, my hope with this book is to give people tools that are flexible so that they recognize that I'm talking about the same thing in all the sections. Um, Venus from, let's say, friendship or hooking up or long-term relationship. But how can you just adjust your viewfinder to understand Venus in these different contexts? And that will allow um, not only for like a a good astrology reading and self-understanding, but also for a deepened practical utility of astrology, which is like super, super my jam. Right. So it's sort of like that understanding the archetype more clearly of the planet then that's going to make it easier to apply it in a multitude of different manifestations or like social context or regardless of gender or age or other things yes. like that. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. And I I it's this this little thing that we're talking about here is at the center of how I use astrology. Um and I think it's at the center of astrology being humanistic, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um because I think astrology can be a lot of things that are not humanistic. Um, it can be used that way because you can use astrology from any angle you want. You know, it's just a mm-hmm. tool. It's inert. Um, and so I'm really interested in uh, the kind of social and humanitarian considerations um, of how I do everything, but in particular, how I practice astrology and talk about it in public. Yeah. Sure. Um, so how, I'm trying to think how many, if I've discussed that, really gone into that. What do you mean when you say humanistic astrology or how does humanistic astrology, as you define it, how is that different from, let's say, whatever other approach that's not humanistic? Mm. My and I don't know if there's like a definition or if it's like an actual like kind of astrologer. It's only when I started speaking at the larger conferences that people were mm. like, "What kind of astrologer are you?" And I'd always be like, "A Jessica one." I don't know. Right. Like, it never even occurred to me to have to choose a side. I was like, "Just an astrologer." Obviously, that's not reality, but that was my take. 
So my understanding, and my, well, I guess what I mean when I say humanistic is yeah. I am interested- I don't mean to put you on the spot or no, anything no, like no, that. No, no, no. I love being put on the spot. I it's just my love def- I love defining terms when we use them because sometimes we take for granted, but then- if somebody was listening to this episode for the first time of their first episode about astrology in general, it's always helpful sometimes just to def- to try to attempt to at least define what we mean, and sometimes that can lead to like fruitful discussions. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, so before I was, I mean, I was practicing astrology, but I was uh, before I went full time. I worked with developmentally disabled children and adults uh, and seniors actually. Um, and my kind of experience doing social work, social services, social work, I guess it is, um, was uh, one of the most instructive things I've ever done. And w- what it taught me was the practice of humanity is not a cerebral practice. It involves the mind. It involves the analyzer. But it is about being emotionally present for what your body is doing, emotionally present for your for your thoughts, and making sure that your actions are consistent with are consistent with being able to see the humanity in others and to engage with the humanity in others. And I, as as a practicing astrologer, um, having a humanistic approach, which is absolutely my approach, it's I am not looking at gay people and straight people. That's not how I'm doing it. I'm looking at people in their lives at this time, and I'm meeting them where they are. And that is essentially like a harm reduction uh, approach to to Mm -hmm. things. And harm reduction is like, you know, if you're a junkie and then you stop doing heroin and you start smoking weed all day every day, thumbs up, harm reduction. Um, So maybe ideally one day you want to stop smoking weed and you want to be sober. Cool. But you you, you've reduced harm you were you were causing. And so for me, meeting people where they are and supporting them in elevating or evolving from that place is meeting them in their humanity. And Mm -hmm. that is my primary objective with astrology. I'm not interested in being the smartest or the best. I don't care about being right. I mean, it's awesome to be right. Um, But I don't care about being right. What I care about is using the the tool of astrology to um, stimulate thought, stimulate growth, and kind of expose choice. Because when we feel that we have a choice, then we start to kind of go bigger. And when we go bigger, we can embody more of ourselves. When mm-hmm. we feel trapped, when we feel um, victimized or whatever it is, we we stop seeing that we have other options and other choices. And that kind of inhibits the, the greatest embodiment of our birth charts. And I really believe in uh, life being an opportunity to embody the best of our birth charts. That's really what I understand. So humanism is really, it is really about honoring the humanity in all of us and in it and in our choices, essentially. I mean, I, I don't know if that, if, if I thought about it more, if I would have a better answer to that, but that's, that's where I, I start from. Sure. Yeah. One of the things that I like that you said that might be worth talking about more is it almost is like you don't, it sounds like you're trying not to come at sitting with a client with a predefined sense of like moral expectations that you're putting on them that your sort of moral whatever your moral situation is doesn't necessarily count and you're not trying to guilt somebody in a consultation or tell them what they should be doing or what's best from some sort of like um exalted like moral standpoint or something Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Can I share some anecdotes about that? Please. Okay. Um, so there's two things that come to mind around that. One is that when I do consultations with people and they tell me they want to get married, not mm-hmm. when they're like in love with someone and they're engaged, but when they're like, oh yeah, I want to get married. I always ask them, why? Why do you want to get married? And I'll tell you probably like 70% of people, especially women, are shocked by that question. And their first response is often, why do you think I shouldn't? Like they're always terrified. But then it it comes to pass that I'm the first person to ever ask these adult women why they want this thing that is a huge responsibility. And they, ju- they just think that they should? They just think that they should. It's also, okay. it's just there's certain assumptions we make about adulthood and mm. we don't question them. Like we question like, do I want a big wedding? Do I care about a white dress? But it's different than is that actually something that I need in order to be whole? Is, mm. you know, a, a, like a legally binding agreement actually important to me? Is a party mm. important to me? Um, these are really important questions. And as, as a 
as a starting point, I'd like to question these things. I don't assume that everyone's straight or everyone's gay. I ask everyone, do you date, you know, what's the gender of what you date? And that unnerves a lot of straight people. <laughs> um, and I think it's great to have our assumptions questioned because when we question Saturn, Saturn as our baseline uh, concept of reality, when we engage that part of ourselves and we question it, there's more room for us to embody our truths. And maybe your truth is you're super straight and you want to get married and you want to have like the whitest of all the dresses and like you want the most conventional things. Cool. But Mm -hmm. choose it. Choose it by knowing that you don't have to choose it. And, you know, so that's one anecdote. And then the other one is, Something that actually came up in an astrology conference where I I gave a talk um, about this topic, and I shared a story about a particular client that I had who um, was cheating on her husband with this her lover and cheating on her lover with this other lover, and half of the room was horrified. They were just just offended. And they were just like, I hope you like kicked her out of your office. And they were very offended by it. And that kind of moralistic judgmentalness um, is not humanity. It's not, it's not humanistic. Um, Mm. It's not my job to decide what someone else's morality should be. It is my job in supporting people to recognize the choices they're making, the impact of those choices on others, but also on their own soul. And um, not from a judging place, but from a place of understanding like this person was like jupiter jupiter sag sag they were like i want i want i want i'm Mm. all capricorn so that's i'm like i want but consequence and so i'm not going to project my take on someone else instead it was supporting that person and seeing how by choosing everything all at once she was actually limiting what she'd have long term and so how could she look at that and so by supporting her and seeing things from her own perspective in alignment with her own values and morality instead of my own I was actually able to help her and hopefully her her kind of like many, many loves. Um, and I think that that's really important because when we as astrologers or therapists or doctors or, well, doctors are separate, astrologers, therapists, um, when we bring too much of our own morality into the conversation, um, then it's about you. And I don't know, why would you want, why would you want that? I want somebody to read a damn chart. I want somebody to tell me based on my chart, you know, not based on their chart. And I think yeah. when astrologers, and we all do this when we're first learning astrology, we think about signs or planets or aspects in relationship to our own experiences. What we need to accept is that we are actually doing that through the the lens of our birth chart instead of through the objective lens of astrology. And that becomes very problematic. And I think it's kind of brings us back to that original thing that you're referring to when, you know, straight white men of class privilege are the only ones writing a book. Then, of course, that's we're only going to see astrology that reflects those things. Um, right. And and I think that that's something we all need to get away from, regardless of where we're starting from. So it takes effort and it takes practice to do so. Yeah. And it's important as an exercise in like flexibility as an astrologer to be able to have, like, um, let's say somebody comes into you and their background is that they're like a Catholic. And then the next consultation you have the next day is they come in and they're like a Hindu and that's their their religious preferences. And those are just like religious examples, but those would be two really obvious examples where if you're projecting your own morality and onto them, it may not align with what their sort of relative like moral standpoint is Absolutely. and how appro- inappropriate that can be in some instances, just obviously for you to do that as an astrologer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I mean, I have clients who are Trump supporters. I personally, very vocally, am not. Uh, I am. <laughs> I, I stand in resistance to everything he stands for, um, and that is not a conflict for me because I am not there to proselytize. I, I have a podcast. I can do it there. Um, mm. I can write. I can tweet. I can do whatever I want. But when I'm counseling someone, I'm counseling them based on their needs and not my needs because mm. it's not the Jessica hour. It's it's the hour of my client. And I think that for me as a consulting astrologer, that is incredibly important and it is in integrity with me. Um, And because of social media and because I have a podcast now, I think uh, my clients are really clear on what my politics and my values are, but they weren't for the bulk of my career because I wasn't, I didn't have a platform on which to uh, publicly discuss these things. So, um, but you know, I, I, over the years have worked with many people who I don't per se agree with, but it's not, that's not my role. I think it's not the role of the astrologer to agree. Um, and you know, different strokes for different folks. So different astrologers are going to practice in different ways, but that's certainly how I, 
how I practice. And again, it is wound up in this idea of, of being a humanist about it. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, it goes back to another point, which is just this idea that astrology is relativistic. And I can't think of anything else that's more showing you like how relative that life is than, than astrology does. And there's something really useful and insightful about that as like a core principle of, of what it's even all about. Agree. Yeah. Strong agree. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to think of any points that we wanted to touch on first before we jump into the Q and A. Is there any other points um, we should have talked about? We talked about the like friends and chosen family part of your book, the hanging out and dating part, and then there's also the like the long term relationships part. Um, is there anything else you wanted to touch on on that that I skipped over? I mean, I. I think there's something really interesting in talking about um, sex and sexuality from an astrological standpoint. Um, I think it's not something that I've seen explored enough by mm. astrologers. And again, when I have, it's been almost exclusively straight white men who have been the ones talking about it, which um, is just great for them and not great for everyone else um, mm. necessarily. And not to say that I... Well, I, th th I'll just say that. And so I think that there is a value in talking about that. In writing the book, I wanted to be able to speak to sex a lot more than I could because of the structure of the book um, mm. and the word count of the book, I guess. Um, but I definitely, um, I think, I think that through kind of within all of the stuff we're talking about, being willing and interested in looking at um, sexuality and not like I like girls, I like boys, but um, how one's sexuality functions and how one embraces or negates their own sexuality, um, how one experiences shame or duty around sexuality. These things are really important and they're important for us to be able to talk about as astrologers because when we relegate the body away from the spirit and the mind and the heart, we're doing a disservice to wholeness. And this is why I am a medical astrologer. Um, I do talk about sex and sexuality a lot because I don't see that any of these things as separate. They're all um, different, like shoots off of the same branch, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that this is again back to my kind of really simplistic, uh, kind of almost like essentialist uh, approach to astrology. I'm maybe using the word essentialist wrong, but anyways, um, because I I really see all of these things as deeply connected and. Um, and I think talking about um, sex and sexuality is a really important part of talking about a person's psyche and a person's heart and and certainly about relationships that aren't platonic in nature, which is a lot of relationships. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a lot more to unpack from there. Maybe some questions will kind of trigger this more, but no, I like that. And I like the idea that you're also addressing like short-term relationships or just, you know, purely sexual relationships as well as platonic relationships or just like short-term hookups because that's like a whole there's a whole like age part of many people's lives where like that's kind of what relationships are for a while but like most older astrology books don't necessarily address because best case scenario they're often addressing like larger broader questions of like will I find when will I find my soulmate or, or is this the person yeah. I'm meant to be with for the rest of my life or something like that and that leaves out like this whole other sort of area of relationships yeah and and to add to that you know a big part of why astrology books historically have an in, in kind of encompassed that is because men are allowed to fuck lots of people. So what is that? Soil your royal oats, like spread your sea, you know, all this stuff. Men are encouraged to have activated so sexualities, but women are only supposed to have sex with their male life partner. So it's really confusing right. because men aren't supposed to, these are straight men who are supposed to have sex with women, but they're not supposed to have sex with their wives. You have sex with your wife, you, you, may, you have sex with women, and then you find a wife. But you want her to be a virgin. Like that's like the history of how it goes down. And right. as women become uh more financially autonomous, you know, as we have birth control, as we have the kind of greater freedoms to be as queer as we please, um, all these things expand what's possible and it expands the conversation around sex and sexuality. Because mm -hmm. now there's a reason to talk about Netflix and chill. Because right. hella people want that, right? Lots of mm -hmm. people want to have sex with someone and they don't want to date them. Or they want to date them, but they don't want to partner with them. And that's new. It's not new that that um, that people want this. It's new that people can do this. You know, we don't have to get married. We don't have to partner up. 
and we don't have to be monogamous. And so I think it, I think it's exciting, and I think it's exciting to be able to reference astrology to see these things, and it's all there. I mean, it's not. It's all there, I guess. It's just the important thing to say. None of it is like, oh, snap, we have to reinvent the the wheel, literally. Um, instead, right. it's just we have to look for it. And it's like on the surface waiting for us to talk about it and waiting for us to use it as, as a reference point. But you have to, you know, you have to know, uh, again, about humans in order to understand astrology thoroughly, IMO. So... Yeah. yeah, and 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 to remove like the, there's not this sense of like shame like there was like let's say 20 or 30 years ago surrounding so many of those things or surrounding the idea that people do obviously have sex before marriage and that's just like a common thing. Yeah. Um yeah, just moving some of those removing some of those things and even when you're an astrologer doing consultations and I'm sure this has always been the case and you would only see traces of it but when you're doing consultations with people, there's like this whole range of different variations in people's lives and people's morality and ethics and sexual orientation and all these different things. And I'm sure astrologers have always been exposed to, um, you know, a multitude of different ways that the, those things manifest. But it's just not often, until recently, talked about openly. Yeah. Instead, it would often just be talked about. Very closely following, like whatever the current uh, societal norms were, or what have you? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's, um, it's so wonderful. You know, one of the things I train myself to learn, and and this actually I, I talked about in the 2013 uh, talk with Barry, mm -hmm. is I train myself very early in my career to look at who uses, who has safer sex, who uses condoms, and who doesn't, and why. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, uh, nobody taught me how to do it. I taught myself how to do it because I thought it was important. And you know what? It is. Because I talk to so many people who do not have safer sex, and the reasons why they do it are varied. And the reason is really important because we must understand that the need for sexual boundaries are really important because it protects your physical body and your emotional body. And mm -hmm. because, you know, you can get STIs and there's something you can get pregnant unintentionally. Like there's physical consequences, but I'm interested in the energetic consequences, you know? Um, and understanding that stuff is, is so useful. It's so practically useful for people. Um, and I'm again, really passionate about what is usable for, for people. So yeah, it, these are things I'm really excited about. And I, and I, my book doesn't, you know, it's not like a sex book. Um, mm -hmm. but I hope that more and more astrologers are brave enough to kind of like bridge that gap and talk more about body, um, in the context of sex and the context of health um, and all that kind of stuff. You know, this is something that comes up in my practice a lot and I'm super passionate about. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important. Um, there's been a bit of a traditional, like revival of, tr of traditional astrology over the past few decades. But one of the things that I don't always like that gets revived as part of that, it's not been revived philosophically, but one of the baggages of like first century astrology. That was also part of like Christianity is this real divide between like spirit and body and an often like a sense of shame or guilt surrounding the body and seeing it as something negative or something problematic in some ways. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. one of the sort of issues then that uh, sometimes gets stuck with astrology, um, but that I feel like is being shed and and sort of pushed away a little bit as as not as too moralistic or too philosophically. Um, divorced from the reality of like what our lives are actually like in the early 21st century. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think also what scholars of all things, um, we tend to get in our head, right? We get get in theory and and that mm -hmm. divorces us from the body. Um, mm -hmm. And when we talk about something like intimacy, um, it is physical, it's it's visceral and it's also emotional. And I really do believe that um, being able to be present for the wholeness of our birth chart requires that we are spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically present. And it doesn't all have to be equal because some people are more one than the other or whatever, but they all have to evolve. And when we try to evolve the spirit without evol evolving the body or evolve the mind and keep on going with the mind, the mind, the mind, and not evolve the heart, then eventually we topple over and we have real problems and those problems will often manifest through the body. And mm. so, um, yeah, there's, there's, um, just wide open highway on this topic. Like it's just, there's so much to say about it. So, um, yeah, it's something that I'm really excited about.
Sure. Uh, one of the things that I, I love about astrology, and I always loved about doing consultations and sitting down and looking at somebody's chart, and something we talked about on the last episode is that like a big secret in astrology is that every consultation that an astrologer does, they learn something new because there's always like a unique birth chart and a unique manifestation in that person's life of those placements, even if there's repetition or even if symbolically you can sort of say ahead of time how this should manifest archetypally, um, you learn something new. And one of the things I love is it's a lot of fun just to see how different people's lives actually work out in practice in all of these different like areas of their life that we're talking about. Is is that something that's fun to you? Do you like enjoy absolutely. that process still in doing consultations? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been full-time consulting since 99 and wow. I have never, and I've counseled uh, twins and triplets, and I have never seen the same chart twice, even yeah. for triplets who have technically identical charts because we have a soul. And mm. our soul is this pesky little free will bunny that just runs around making choices. And I think that's just delicious and exciting, and I love it. And and so, yeah, I I mean, I love reading birth charts so much. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's it's constant learning and it's constant engagement with not just what a person is made of, but how a person chooses to be. I mean, like, forgive me for this, like, too on the nose uh, metaphor, but like, we both may have a Blue Yeti microphone, but mm -hmm. you know how to use it and I don't. Real talk, right? Sure. And I just think, like, we can all have the same equipment, but that doesn't mean we're going to use it equally. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. we're going to use it the same way or for the same reasons. And, and that is just really exciting to me as a counseling astrologer because I want to mm. talk to people about the choices they're making and empower them to see um, what options they have within those choices uh, because that is where the soul evolves and that that soul evolution kind of drags the mind and the body and the heart with it in a really beautiful way. So sure, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, brilliant. Um, well. Why don't we transition into? We put out a call for questions about like astrology and relationships and different things, different discussion topics, and we got a bunch of questions from listeners. Uh, so why don't we transition into taking a look at some of those if you're up for it? I'm always up for question and answer. Okay, brilliant. Okay. So um, let me see. This is a good one. So this is from Catherine Urban, who actually has a book coming out very soon. What what day is your book being released? By the way, uh, uh, New Year's Eve, 2019. So 12:31, 2019. Brilliant. Okay, New Year's. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. So if you order it, if you pre-order it, you'll have it in your pause for New Year's Eve. Good idea. Yeah. I'll put a link link to it in the pre-order page um, on the description page for this episode on the astrologypodcast.com. Um, so this is from Catherine Urban, who has a book coming out, and her Twitter is at, at Astro Catherine. She says, sometimes couples think it would be fun to get a reading together. Do you have any thoughts on this? So yeah. this is something that comes up because uh, you know, most people don't know this if you're not an astrologer. But when astrologers, astrologers have discussions about this because sometimes that, even though it just sounds okay in theory, like sometimes that doesn't work out, or sometimes is actually not a good idea, or can be super awkward. Yeah, I I discourage people from getting reading couples readings for me. Do you? Um, okay, so you actively oh, dis discourage I it. At actively this point? discourage it unless okay. uh, the needs of a child are involved. They mm. are in a long term committed relationship. Um, or they have something like real that they are working with because relationships are like blown glass, you know? You don't want to fuck with them. You don't want to be constantly futzing with them, you know? I, I think that when we as individuals take responsibility for how we participate, what we participate in, what we consent to, we often don't need a relationship reading. Now, mm. couples counseling is a different thing because mm. everybody has to show up and self-define. When you meet with an astrologer, we do all the talking. You know what I mean? Like we mm -hmm. tell you. And that's not always helpful, especially when the problem is one person doesn't want to listen and the other person's doing all the heavy lifting. Well, then what's an astrology reading going to do for you? You know what I mean? Sure. And and I've I I do couples counseling a fair amount. Um, I have once had someone throw something at me. Um, I have, <laughs> um, I've had a lot of tears. I've helped a lot of couples for sure. Um, but it is, it's only for relationships that are ready for it, you know? Yeah. And, and in terms of this and the reasons why it's problematic is you get the same issue if you have like a parent and a child that come in as well, where like the parent is like bringing their child to get an astrology reading, but then they sit on, in on it. 
and that can create a, a not helpful dynamic where the yeah. the child doesn't feel like they can be open and honest with you necessarily because they have like their parent looking over their shoulder. Yeah, I don't let parents. I would. I mean, when I read for children, which I do very rarely, I mm-hmm. do not let parents in the room, and I only will do it under the commitment from the parent that um, everything I talk about with the child is completely confidential. Mm-hmm. And I clarify for them that I'm not a therapist, which means it is not my responsibility to report anything. And if the child tells me they're doing anything, that's a confidential thing they're telling me, and I'm going to be good to their trust. And if mm-hmm. they don't want that, they should see a therapist. <laughs> sure. um, but I, I am not, I actually just yesterday went to Berkeley High School um, and I got to speak to a class of high school students in their last year of high school um, about my job and like how I got it and all that kind of stuff. And they asked me wow. a million questions. It was so awesome. It's my second yeah, year cool. of doing it. Thank you. Yeah, it was really, really fun. Um, and, you know, inevitably they always ask like, will you tell me about myself? What about my chart? And I, I always say the same thing to children, which is until you're at the age where you can say to me, an adult, I disagree with you and feel totally clean about it, then I'm not going to give you a reading because with children, we have a power differential. And that power differential is I'm the adult and I'm telling you something. And children, you know, you can be, I was a very precocious, very opinionated, very strong-willed child. Shocking. I know I was. And still, when an adult said something to me, it was an adult saying something to me. So that power differential cannot be negotiated around. It doesn't matter how cool or down the adult is. And Mm. so I'm really, um, I'm really mindful of that. And the kind of consultations I give to young people are different than the ones I give to older people. Mm. Even people under the age of 25, I will reframe things in in a different way or under the age of, yeah, 23, 25. Um, under that age, I will frame things in a slightly different way because, you know, all of your adult experiences are mainly like when you're a teenager still. So I really... Um, I'm a big, you know, I'm such a Capricorn that I think like until you hit your twenty Saturn return, you're in your childhood. Um, and so I I try to be really respectful of that. And to to me, that's not um like a minimizing someone because they're young. It's respecting their where they are. And I think that's our job as response as responsible astrologers to recognize that not all ages are the same. Of course they're not. We're astrologers. <laughs> so is your is your concern then like the more like the do no harm dictum that you feel like if you're going to you, you might say something to a younger person that they're going to take in a way that not, might not be healthy compared to somebody that's older? Yeah, if I'm talking to let's say a 38-year-old, mm-hmm. um they will know who they are through lived experience. Now let's say I'm talking to a 23-year-old, they know who they are through feeling. Um through theory but not yet lived experience in the same way. No, at 23, you have, you know, how many years of kind of adultish lived experience, depending on your circumstances, maybe it started at 16, maybe it started at 18. Um, but really, th- this is a different thing. And and I think it's really important to recognize that when an astrologer says, this is who you are, or this is what's going to happen, it's scary to people. You know, we have a power and with that power comes a responsibility and my uh, kind of sense of how to manage that responsibility is to really hold, um, make sure I spare more words to uh, free will and choice Mm -hmm. and potential when I'm talking to younger people because the 20s are a time where you're beating your head against your childhood and not being who you used to be or not being who your parents are, whatever it is. Um, and in your thirties and your fifties and your seventies, that's not what you're doing anymore. And, sure. and as astrologers, I feel that, you know, we have a responsibility to counsel people based on what we understand of astrology, right? Which is that time does change you. It does mature you. And there are generational transits that happen at specific ages and they mark different levels of individuation. So I kind of, work in respect to that. I don't hide things from people. I'm very direct, but I try to be respectful around that stuff. So it's not that you wouldn't do a consultation with somebody younger. It's just oh, that no. you're going to frame it differently and be more careful about making like overly deterministic statements with a younger person. 100%. Yeah. I work with a lot of younger people. Yes. Yeah. Got it. And okay, I work with makes... teens and and young people as well like that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, do want to say, going back to the question, there was one instance that I remember that I did do a consultation with a couple where it actually worked out well, where it was this older couple and they were both in their 70s and, or 80s. And they, I'd done like a newspaper interview and they saw it and just thought the idea of astrology was novel and contacted me and asked if I could read both of their charts in the consultation. And when we were doing the half, when we were reading the 
the older gentleman's chart, um, he I was making some delineations about like Saturn in the second house and um, issues surrounding money or apprehensions or fears surrounding it. And it wasn't really connecting. And he was like, no, I don't really, that doesn't really connect at all. Or he was saying like it didn't make any sense. And then his wife spoke up and she's like, no, that's exactly you. You grew up in the Great Depression and your family was in poverty for like the first entire chapter of your life. And and that has carried through psychologically and affected every decision that you've made subsequently as long as I've known you for the last 60 years. <laughs> And so, That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, well, and it's because it's like the person sitting next to him was like the one person who knew him the best and the longest and had the most objective perspective with which to view his life, as opposed to the person whose chart it was, where oftentimes it's hard to step outside of your own life and look at mm-hmm. it objectively. So, I will say that was one of the few exceptions where um, there was a value or there was something that was brought to the table instead of something that was problematic about doing a, a Consultation with a couple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I. I mean, I should say I. I've done a lot of consultations with couples. I love it. I. I've, I think it can bring a lot of value, but the couple has to be ready for it, and there sure. has to be a reason. I think the mistake people make is they come in because they think it'll be interesting, or they want another past life connection, and it's just like that's a fool's errand. You're going to be disappointed with what happens. Um, sure. I, I. I really think as direct and kind of. Um, kind of realistic as my one-on-one readings are. My couple's readings are much more direct and much more <laughs> realistic. So it's kind of like a buyer beware moment as far as I'm concerned. But um, when you do couple's readings, um, personally, me, what I do is I I study both of the individual's charts and then I pull up a composite chart. I work with composites. And so I, I counsel uh, based on all three of those charts. That's what I tend to work with. What do you work with? Uh yeah, like the the natal charts and like looking at their seventh houses and things like that, and then their sinistry. I, I heard actually that you you prefer composite charts over sinistry and don't look I at sinistry, sinistry that much. Is that true? Yeah, I you hate, hate sinistry. You, I hate it. You go so far as to say you hate sinistry. I hate it, and I hate whole sign houses. Let me just be provocative. <laughs> yeah, okay. I do. I hate both those things. Yeah, that's fine. Thank I, you. Thank uh, you very much. That's cool. But you <laughs> so you focus on composite charts. And just before we started recording, you actually said you have a preference in terms of the two variations. Um, there's the midpoint composite chart, and then there's the Davison chart. And you are on team composite, not team Davison. Correct. Yes. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, I, I am a big believer in you are who you are. I am who I am. But when we come together in a relationship, that relationship is a, a third animal. It is. Mm. It has its own chart. And sure. when we look at just synastry, it's. I don't think it's comprehensive. Um, I don't mm. find it to be as accurate myself. And I have a lot of friends who are astrologers who strongly disagree with me, and that's chill for me. I don't mind. But mm. I um, like I'm not attached to it. It's just how I work. I definitely. Um, I also will say I don't fixate on um, the seventh house. Because okay. I don't know that the seventh house is actually the most important thing because um, I'm like, first of all, I'm planet obsessed. Um, and second of all, I I think every house in the birth chart is a relationship house when we're looking at relationships. Mm. Every house in the birth chart is a health house when we're looking at your health. Um, of course, some are going to be more than others, but I that tends to be my kind of take on it. And um you know, when I'm looking at relationships, I'm looking at power dynamics. I'm looking at relationship uh, communication, and I'm looking at how we share responsibility, um, because those are the things that break people up, and therefore they're the things that can hold you together if they're mm. done right. So those are those are kind of like big places that I I focus. Um, but I, you know, maybe we can get more into that as as the questions progress. Sure, definitely. Yeah, I think actually this next question might sort of address that or might lead into that. So. This question is from Diana Rose um, at D D A M Senna. I'll put I'll put it in the the it's hard description to page. Say handles, Tw- Twitter but handles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. Um, hey, girl. Hi. Yeah, Diana is awesome. So yes. her question is: When is it actually beneficial to look at a beloved's birth chart, synastry, composite, etc.? I feel like a lot of people will preemptively investigate these things. Like before the first date, and end up making wildly incorrect assumptions before they've even met. Yeah, I love that question. Yeah, um, I've been with my current partner. We're about to have our eight-year anniversary, and I couldn't tell you where anything is in his chart. Um, I really, you don't know? 
I mean, he's a Gemini. I mean, did uh, and- you ask? Did well, you it, ask the birth dad or anything like how soon or or was that just not a priority for you? Months at all? into the relationship, I asked for it. Um, uh, okay, and, I think that yeah. I'm going to say right from the start though that that's atypical. That's slightly atypical. I think you would totally. say yes. for for an astrologer. Yes, it's highly atypical. Okay, I'm okay. also I but but I stand by it and I'm yeah, so no, passionate fine. about it because yeah. here's the thing: if you're an astrologer. Let's say you're a good astrologer too, okay? Right. Then you, even if you don't know nothing about their birth chart, you're going to know way more about that person than a normal person would. I mean, sure. if you're not a muggle, you already have an advantage, right? And on top of it, I'm psychic, right? So I have like a real advantage in relationships, and it's a disadvantage in practical terms. And the reason why I say that is because if you have data about a person, Mm -hmm. Then if you are telling yourself that that data is just data and you just want to know about that person, you are lying to yourself because you're only doing it to satiate your own birth chart, IMO. And I really believe that we should know a person through practical terms before we start pairing that emotional, physical, mental knowing with the analytic ideas about astrology. You are Mm. not objective when you are a subject. And the second you have sex with someone or you have a crush on someone, you are part of their birth chart. You are a subject in their birth chart, which means Mm. you are not going to see anything, anything objectively. I don't care how genius you think you are. You are not going to see it objectively. And I think I'm a damn genius. And I still, I I really stand by this. So I want to say that you know, if somebody's asking me, and I'm so glad you are, thank you very much. Um, if somebody's asking me, uh, don't look at your partner's chart. Don't look at your crush's chart. Don't do it until you've already made an assessment for yourself uh, based on your felt experience, based on the evidence you're being shown about the person. Because seeing someone's potential will get in your way. Why don't you just see who the person chooses to be in front of you and how compatible it is in your felt experience? Astrology is not meant to allow us to evade um, intimacy. And Mm. when we use astrology to evade intimacy, um, it backfires on us. It backfires on us. There's a lot of astrologers who've been practicing for many years who can tell you that they're not happy in their love lives, that astrology has not uh, facilitated greater intimacy, right? Um, and the reason why is because it's we're not the great and powerful Oz. We're not just heads. And astrology is mental. It's just me- it's a mental practice. So if you want emotional connection, sexual connection, if you want vulnerability, and if you want presence, then don't function primarily out of your brain. Sure, and and, and there's just a danger of making assumptions, like going into the relationship with assumptions. No matter how good of an astrologer you are. Um, you start. You might start making assumptions about the person before you've even gotten to know them, or before, let's say, even the best case scenario, before you've gotten to know the specific ways that the archetypal placements in their chart actually play out or manifest in their life or in their personality or in their actions or how they choose to manifest that when there's parts of their cho- chart that they manifest as, as a result of free will or what have you. Absolutely. And also different relationships do different things. Like Again, if we come back to the concept of the composite, my composite chart with my best friend is not going to be the same as my co- that my, my composite chart with my partner. My partner experiences me in a completely different way. My moon, my Mars, my sun is a completely different Mars, moon, and sun with mm. a romantic partner and a platonic partner and a colleague, right? And um, when you're vulnerable and you're excited about someone, you're not going to be able to read that effectively. Of course not. Mm. So it's a great question. I wish more people would be uh, careful. And reading the horoscope of your crush, it's a fool's errand. And you know, we're all fools. I'm no judgment, but it's not it's not super wise. Okay. And um, yeah, to put, I mean, I do think it is important to I, I still engage in it and, and do read charts or have read charts, but I do think it's important for astrologers, even as a cautionary thing, just to go along with that to develop the ability to, on the one hand, like read a person and look at a chart and be able to make an assessment to some extent about their life and their personality and, and different aspects of their life, and to be relatively accurate when it comes to that. But then, on the other hand, also to um, hold off on making judgments about people, especially new people that come into your life that are going to be part of your life, um, until they've made those actions or done those things, and mm-hmm. to avoid like typecasting a person or um, projecting previous experiences with certain planetary placements or zodiac signs or whatever 
onto future relationships and assume that it's going to be the exact same thing no matter how close the placements are to past instances that you've seen to yeah. like allow or give some room to see how things go and how people act before sort of jumping to conclusions almost. Yeah, energy is energy but not all energy fits into a different container in, in the same way. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I'm a big fan of looking at exes, ex-friends, ex-colleagues, ex-lovers, uh looking at their charts and really studying them because I have the gift the kind of like uh, perspective of retrospect. Like I saw the whole damn thing happen and now I can understand it. That's a right. great way of using astrology. But to imagine that, you know, if I say to you, oh, you know, I'm dating a sun, moon, and rising Gemini, you already had a million thoughts. You already had a million opinions about, uh oh, sun, moon, and rising a Gemini shit, right? Like most people would have ideas. And so, you know, when we are subject, we cannot be object. And to take responsibility for that, I, I think is really important. And again, I'm coming from the perspective of being a counselor type. And so I'm interested in helping people to um, have more whole and embodied lives and birth charts. And you cannot do that if you're scanning for danger and reading someone else's chart so that you know what to expect. That's right. not, there's no cheat for life, honestly. Like it doesn't work, but it's a great question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And just to back up what you're saying and my own personal experience about a decade ago, I um I was in this relationship just that just went really bad and like it turned into a stalker like situation where i was being harassed for like a year after leaving the relationship and it was very like abusive and bad and just a very dark part of my life and i tried to move forward and like a few months after that i met this new person and sort of a, this relationship came out of nowhere even though i would, i had sworn off relationships after that previous one which had just sort of ended a few months earlier and one day we're talking, and it's one of our first sort of quasi dates, and she drops her birth chart placements, and the chart is just extremely similar, like same rising sign and like a few other placements as the ex who had just been stalking and like harassing me for a year, and it just like my initial reaction was just one of immediate like fear and has trepidation and all of these other things of like oh my god like I'm about to walk into the exact same relationship. Um, but luckily, as an astrologer, I sort of caution myself not to just immediately jump to conclusions and just to let things sort of play out and just see how they went before um, making all sorts of assumptions about exactly how things would go based on the similarity or the repetition of certain placements that I had just experienced, and that maybe I would experience different variations of some of those placements than how they acted out in the other person's life, you know, previously. And then that turned into like a 10-year, you know, relatively successful, happy relationship um, that I'm still in. Um, yeah. And that was a really important lesson for me as an astrologer. That's and that's massive. one of the that is one of the cautionary tales that I would tell people in general is just to be careful and why you should be careful, because sometimes you might run into situations like that where prejudging people could be a major mistake. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, when we have to learn how to have boundaries, we'll learn it whether we want to or not. Like, you know, and if that's how the, the, the universe, Jesus, whoever you want to blame astrology on, um, is trying to get you to learn it is through these particular aspects in somebody else's chart, then who are you to stand in the way? I think it's really important that we focus on our own birth charts. I think that's where our greatest growth occurs is when we focus on our own both birth charts and understand that if I have an issue to learn around boundaries or around direct communication or around emotionally showing up when things get messy, then I will attract no one but people who force me to embody those things. Like that's just how the birth chart runs. And so if we look for answers in other people, we lose the thread. And the birth chart tells you everything you need to know about yourself, everything you need to know. And so it's, a, it's about being brave and not seeking shortcuts. You know, I think it really is. And it is, it requires bravery to have feelings for someone and to date someone and let someone into your life. And, you know, I think using astrology as a tool for being brave instead of looking for a shortcut around having to be brave is a really good approach. Definitely. And yeah. and also you're gonna see if you're like dating different people for a long enough time period, you're gonna see repetitions and like certain placements. Or certain things that come up over and over again and may represent either relationship dynamics that you're playing out in different variations of, or may just represent because of how your birth chart is 
playing out like certain types of energies that you tend to attract for whatever reason, um, whether that's healthy ones or, or unhealthy ones or what have you. That, you know, you may have a predisposition towards like certain rising signs or certain Venus signs or Mars signs or what have you. And experiencing those, the different variations of some of the same placements becomes one of the great, like joys and and sort of like educational things that you get to do as an astrologer. Yeah. To whatever extent, if you are sort of paying attention as as you go. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah. What was your experiencing though once you actually did see your partner's chart? I mean, that's like several months into the relationship. That's so interesting. Like, yeah. what what was your reaction? Um, I was, so, uh, there was, there's a couple, uh, reactions. One is I mainly only looked at it because he had something going on and I was like answering a question. That's really, I've never studied his birth chart, never okay. sat down with his birth chart. Um, because I don't need to, because I'm experiencing him and, uh, I'm showing up and when he bugs me, which he does, um, I deal with it. And when he pleases me, which he does, I deal with that. And like all the things in between. And, um, so I mainly just, if he's like going through a time, I'll look at a chart and be like, oh snap. Okay. So now let's look at what's going on here and we'll talk about it that way. So I'll try to be supportive. Um, mm -hmm. so there's, there's that. I, the one thing that I did notice is that I was in a relationship for almost a decade, um, before getting into this one, not immediately, but like my last major relationship, um, was with a person who had like a million planets in Scorpio with a Gemini rising. And my current partner is a Gemini with a Scorpio rising. So I was like, that's nice. not what I ever would have picked. Like, I wouldn't have thought that my triple Capricorn ass would be like Gemini Scorpio. Um, right. but I, I apparently adore it. Uh, who knew? So um, that's a fun thing. And you know what? I've never done any kind of like astrological investigation into why I like that pairing or why that I like that combination mm -hmm. because it's just data collection. It's not going to help me be more whole. It's not going to serve my evolution. So I don't fuck with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes I've seen repetitions, like every relationship I've had has always been with another fixed sign rising. Uh, and I have Aquarius rising, so I have a fixed sign rising. So it's just some random. You'll notice random pieces of data that may or may not like mean something in the long term. They probably yeah. do, but sometimes it just becomes like data that is one of the mysteries of life, or yeah, what exactly. have you. Yeah, and it's like it's like how much. I mean, the the more practice of an astrologer one becomes, the more it's like, well, you can have just like a chamber of secrets full of data, but who's going to use it? Like I'm, sure. I'm such a Capricorn in this way where I'm just like really interested in utility. I'm really interested in, if it's useful, I want it. If it serves the work, I want it. And if it doesn't, then I'm just going to kind of lose track of it. And, um, uh, and, and that's just what works for me. And, you know, let's hold space for different birth charts are going to have different priorities. Right. So that's just what works for me. Sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. We already touched on this one, but it was a good one from Advice Astrologer at ADV Astrologer. They asked, I would like to know if you guys prefer to use Davison or Composites. And your answer was a strong composite. And I also use Composites. I never thought Davison's made sense because a composite is like a midpoint between planetary positions. So if like one person's Venus is at 14 degrees of a sign and the other person is at 16 degrees, then the composite chart will put Venus at 15 degrees of that sign as like a midpoint in space. But the Davison composite does a midpoint in time where it's like if one person's born on November 1st and another person's born on November 2nd, uh, 3rd, then it'll create a chart for November 2nd. Um, yeah. yeah and, and then that's the sort of composite chart. So I always liked the other, the original composite is more of like a, a abstraction of the idea of midpoint theories and midpoints as like a technical thing rather than creating, um, you know, some other chart in time. Yeah, I, I'm with you a hundred percent. Although I couldn't have said it as well as you did, but yes, agree. <laughs> Got it. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, here's a good one. <laughs> this, this, I think you'll like this. So, how do? And this is tied in with one that we talked about. Um, yeah, actually, let's. This is by the same person, actually. Advice astrologer. They said, "I'm curious what you think about uh, quote unquote twin flames. Are you a big fan of of twin flames?" I no, hard no. no. I do not like twin flame. The concept of twin flames, I am not a huge fan of in general. 
Okay. Um, I won't say I don't believe in it. It's not for me to believe it. I mean, I don't know. Is Twin Flames a belief system? I can't really, I don't fully understand that part of it. I mean, to me, it's a new thing. Like, I feel like people have only it started is. talking about this in the past few years, maybe yes. tops. And it's just like out there that this is a concept that exists. And, um, but astrologically, it's like this didn't, wasn't a thing until very recently. No, it's, I mean, listen, there's no perfect person, which means there's no perfect partnership. And mm. my, my concern about the concept of a twin flame is when people come into my office and they're like, I have met my twin flame, what they're really saying is I'm in a Plutonian relationship where I'm not getting my needs met and everything is chaotic and I'm not happy, but I want it to work so badly because I feel a soul connection. That's okay. what I hear. And to me, that's not uh, something that I'm really, uh, I don't think that's great. I think it's ideal for us to seek uh, functional, healthy relationships in the here and now. And I am of the mind that we have a soul connection and a spiritual connection with every person we have contact with, and it's not enough. We need functionality. We need compatibility um, in real time. Otherwise, it's destructive, and it's not the best of our birth charts. And if you're not embodying your birth chart to the best of your ability, then you're going to have to go back and fix it. So you might as well do it right the first time. Sure. Yeah, and this is tied to actually another question by Rochelle Stein at Rashbon, uh, where she says, "How do I identify and navigate, quote unquote, soulmates and karmic relationships?" And this is all sort of part of the same category, and it's something that uh, I feel like clients often come to astrologers wanting to know. And and I think one of my early motivations for astrology was wanting to know things like that of identifying if a person is your soulmate. But I don't. I don't feel like astrologers can tell you that. I feel like that's something that a client wants to know abstractly, but it's one of those things that in some instances is beyond the scope of what astrologers can say with 100% certainty. Do you feel mm -hmm. the same way or am I yeah. how do you feel about that? No, I, I I agree with that, but but even maybe even more like grandpa get off telling you to get off my porch kind of vibes. I would say that um if I may own may. it. Yeah, um please. thank you very much. Um the idea of a soulmate, it's complicated to me because to have a soul connection so is So you're rejecting inevitable. the idea in general that, that there is such thing as a soulmate? I'm rejecting the idea that, that not everyone is a soulmate. I think that, that the, the idea, this is kind of back to something we were talking about in a different context before. Mm -hmm. The soul union um, is... Every relationship is meant to be a soul union. Your relationship to your cat, to your bestie, to your male person, if you're not doing it with your soul, you're not doing it right, you know? Mm. We are meant to show up with our soul. And I think that the kind of misuse of the concept of soulmate is it's conflictual and I feel a yearning and I'm pulled to it, but it isn't working. It isn't functioning. And when it isn't functioning in practical terms effectively, that doesn't make it more spiritual. Let me speak more astrologically. Okay. When we have strong Neptune connections with someone, or when we are very Neptunian ourselves, we seek spiritual union, but we have a tendency to um, orient ourselves towards potential instead of evidence. When we are deeply Plutonian or in a Plutonian relationship, we tend to go for the most powerful feeling instead of the healthiest and best adjusted feeling. Um, and when we have a relationship that is deeply Plutonian, it can be conflictual and it makes you feel like you're pulled by a magnet, but it doesn't necessarily work in a healthy way. And so from my perspective, um, these kinds of relationships are often called soul unions or twin flame unions, but that doesn't mean that they're actually better. Um, because you have a deep yearning for someone and it's not functioning well is not actually like what I would characterize as something I want to support. So the when when we unpack the idea of a twin flame or a soul union, it's often very hard for people to explain what they mean other than I really want this person and I really want it to work and it isn't working. And that's where I, as grandpa Capricorn astrologer, um, and just like, well, I I that's not what I'm here to support. I'm here to support someone's best interest and not best idea. Okay. Yeah. Sorry I mean, if that's it, offensive or sad to people. No, that's fine. And I mean, part of it is it seems like just a presumption that there is like one relationship, and everybody wants to find like that one Bingo. relate relationship, like the movies that they'll they'll fall in love and be swept off their feet, and then they'll 
live the rest of their lives together for decades and decades and eventually grow old and like die holding hands. <laughs> and that's exactly it. Right. And and it's like, well, sometimes that does happen. I mean, there are relationships that one earlier I was talking about of that couple um that came to me for that consultation that was in their 80s. They'd spent like 60 years together of their life and had a relatively successful and happy marriage and they met when they were like 18. And I feel on some level to the extent that they lived their entire lives in that one relationship that they met very early on and it ended up being happy and fulfilling and they had children and grandchildren and what have you, that that you could say like, yeah, sure, that that was the case maybe in those then that instance that they had met the love of their life and there was this one person and they lived their entire life with them. Um you know, I don't know if that's necessarily always the case with everybody. Like you might meet a few people in your life that you end up having like a karmic relationship with, or that end up being very defining relationships in your life that you learn something from and grow from as a person, and that you love and care for that person very intensely during that part of your life. But there's just many different scenarios, and that one sort of ideal. Um, not Cinderella story, but like sort of fairy tale story is not going to be the case for everybody necessarily, which is why it's kind of awkward when a person comes to you as an astrologer and, and asks to tell you if this person is that person, because in most instances, that's not usually going to be the case. And and it's not useful to know that, honestly, because mm. if I say to you, I cannot tell you how many clients have come to me, and some astrologer or some psychic was like, this person's supposed to be your soulmate. They're your twin flame. You're going to end up with this person. And then right. inevitably, the relationship doesn't work. Yeah. And then the client struggles. They're like, how did I mess up my one chance at love? Like yeah. The most important thing is dealing in the here and now with the relationships you have to the best of your ability. And if someone isn't healthy or compatible for you, if they're not showing up, walk away. Have mm. faith in yourself. Have faith in your capacity to love and to manifest more experiences. And don't become attached to the idea or the potential with someone. Instead, deal with the reality of what exists between you and that person. I think that's just so important. Yeah, yeah definitely. And and they're also just looking at things like sinistry or composite charts or the birth charts or the transits that a person's having in terms of relationships, um, you know, there's going to be in any relationship, there's going to be things that work out well in areas where your relationship goes relatively smoothly, smoothly, and there's going to mm -hmm. be areas where you guys have tensions for whatever reason. And in some relationships, those tensions and the downsides are going to be negotiable, or they're going to be things mm -hmm. that you can you can push through and, and get over, or, and don't. You know, destroy the relationship or make it non viable. Whereas there's going to be other situations where those downsides end up outweighing things and the relationship, you end up having to walk away at some point for whatever reason as a result mm -hmm. of that. And while it's sometimes useful with astrology to identify that ahead of time, um, and the astrologer can do that to some extent, it's not always going to be the case that they can say 100% if those difficulties are going to be surmountable or not. And often that ends up being. A choice that you end up having to make at some point during the course of the relationship, which is my main reason why I kind of it sounds weird if somebody does come to me and say another astrologer told them that this person was my soulmate or that we were twin flames, that I almost feel like that's almost unethical to some extent because it's just completely removed the element of free will. And it's also yes. Um, the astrologer is going out on a limb by saying that this is definitely like the the love of your life and the one relationship that you're meant to be with for the rest of your life. And I think astrology has limitations um, that need to be recognized in terms of that. Absolutely, I agree. And I, I'll just kind of add to that: if you're listening to this and you're a practicing astrologer at whatever stage of your development, there are two kinds of problems in relationships. There's the problems that are your problems, no matter who you're dating, no matter who you're with. They're the problems that you're going to find in your birth chart that mm. you need to come into a bondment around. And then there's the problems in your birth chart that you've already outgrown or that you, that are actually not things that you need to be dealing with in your life. They're destructive problems. They're mm. not problems that help you come to wholeness. And if you can determine that the problems between you and the person you're dating or are friends with or whatever are destructive and they're not calling you to be a more embodied, healthy part of your life, uh, get the hell out of the relationship. That's the lesson. The lesson is don't consent to things that are unhealthy. Embody your best potential. 
And if that breaks the relationship, then the relationship was already broken. And if that makes the relationship stronger, then you can't help but continue to be together, right? And so don't worry so much about predicting what comes next. Instead, uh, concern yourself with enacting what is best. And then the best case scenario can't help but unfold. It works. It, I know it sounds overly simple, but it works. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. to go back to something you were saying earlier, the, one of the things that annoys me about people trying to identify the pieces and saying that certain pieces are karmic or certain relationships are karmic is I really agree with the point that I think you were making earlier, which is like every thing in the chart is karmic to a certain extent. And mm -hmm. it, like if you're going to adopt karmic philosophy, like in like Indian astrology, for example, where that came from, they just consider like every part of the chart to be karmic or to be the result of past actions, whatever you mean by that. And every relationship in your life is going to have some broader karmic um, meaning or uh, is going to be the result of something if you're framing things in that sort of philosophical context. So it's almost mm -hmm. like weird to try to say that one relationship is more karmic than another on some level. I agree. I think it's a misunderstanding of what karma and karmic relationships are. All connections that we have are karmic because we are karmic mm -hmm. beings. If, if you resonate with the concept of karma, it's not just my hard relationships are karmic or my long-term relationships are karmic. Um, right. it, your karma is your karma. It's and you know it's you. Sure. So yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Yeah, there's a great yeah. book called The Greatness of Saturn. Have you ever read it? Yes, I love that book. I read it at Kepler. It was recommended to me by Dennis Harness, and it's really intense. But it's mm -hmm. it's a good good book. It is. It is. It's it's uh, something called a living myth. So you're supposed to kind of approach it, uh, reading it in a really uh, spiritually present way. And if if you're somebody who's interested in the concept of a karmic relationship, it's a great. Uh, book to check out. It's called The Greatness of Saturn. And, um, you know, when you read it, you, you're supposed to read it with reverence of, of like a, you know, it, it's a spiritual context. So read it with intention. Um, but it is it is a really great book for this topic, I think. Yeah. And it is intense. I do want to like warn people ahead yeah. of time that's oh, yeah. an in intense read and process. It'll mess you up. It'll mess you up in a really sure. great way. If you're in a Saturn transit, read it. If you're not in a Saturn transit and you've just recovered from one, maybe wait, maybe wait. You're right yeah, about that. <laughs> sure. All right. Um, so, all right. So let's keep going down the list here. So this is from uh, Rob Bailey at Old School Astro on Twitter. He says, "How do you feel about the concept of quote unquote sister signs as it pertains to relationship astrology or synastry?" Um, and yeah, let's, so let's leave it at that. So this is another one of those concepts where I feel like this has come out of nowhere in the past few years where lots of people are talking about sister signs, but it doesn't seem clearly defined. It seems like one person will be talking about it and they think it means one thing and then I'll see another person talking about it and they think sister signs are another thing. And it seems yeah. kind of all, all over the place because it's not like a traditional concept necessarily. Like I don't remember seeing it until Never relatively recently. It. Okay, I've only yeah. heard of it on Twitter. So um, that's funny. There's like concepts like that, like twin flames and like um, sister signs and other other things like that that are sort of being generated almost spontaneously. Like on some level, cusps is kind of like that, but but it goes back further. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think you know. I mean, I think twin flames comes out. Oh, it's not from astrology, so I don't know its origins, but it's not like an astrology concept. Um, but it's that thing when you tell someone you're an astrologer, they show you their palm and they ask you to read their tarot cards and they ask you to talk to their dead relative. Like people kind of conflate all these things, even though they're completely separate things. Okay. Um, but I do, I've never heard of it outside of Twitter. Um, and this is the danger that I kind of referred to early, much earlier in the conversation about the democrat the democratization of astrology is that who is vetting what? Like, mm -hmm. where are the sources of this? You know, there's so much. There's so much to be done with astrology. There's so much data about astrology. The concept of a sister sign, I don't know how that's necessary. I mean, I don't know. Am I being too much of a grandpa right now? I don't know. But I, I, I just don't. I, I don't know what that means. I yeah, don't I, don't, I don't know. And, and people, like, let me give you, I don't know what definitions you've heard. I've heard a couple. Like one of them, I've heard somebody say that it's signs that are opposite. Um, but I don't know if that makes sense just conceptually from a Ancient standpoint, I guess, is how I approach these things because they're signs of a, the opposite polarity. Um, so that's one definition I've seen. I've seen other people theorize that maybe it's supposed to refer to planets or, or signs of the zodiac that are ruled by the same planet. If you follow hmm. that rulership scheme at all, I don't know. I do. I do. 
Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So like maybe Libra and Taurus might be sister signs because they're both ruled by I would like that. I Vena think that's Venus? cute. I don't think yeah, it's I mean, necessary. I don't think, sure. I don't see how it improves anybody's life. But I think, you know, I mean, listen, you know, I think as a person in middle age, I'm really open to learning new things and new astrologers coming up with uh, new ways of looking at things and uh you know, I'm down for that. I have not heard anything compelling about this sister science concept myself. I can, I could see. I mean, I have ancient nothing. I'm, I'm not an ancient oriented person, but I definitely think um, I could. Uh, you know, I could, I could extrapolate based on like the, you know, Venus Taurus, uh, the Libra Taurus idea, or even opposite signs being sister signs, like how sure. it's essentially, you know two sides of the same energy field. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. But is it necessary? Like, how does that... And, and uh, it seems to me like a distraction from the central issue, which is how can you show up in your relationships in a way that is um, really engaging and present and whole so that you can get the most out of your relationships? And if that means you're just trying to show up engaging and present and whole for the fact that all you're doing is boning with someone, cool, do that. Or if it's about being in a long-term monogamous relationship, chill do that. But I don't know that the sister science thing or so many other like theories of basically pulling yourself back from the data and theorizing about the data. I don't know that that helps with this topic, the topic of um, relationships and relating with other humans in a successful way. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I would just say that um, it's just not well defined and nobody has a, con there's no consistent definition. So if somebody wants to come up with a consistent definition and everybody wants to vote on it and get on board with saying that sister signs is like this one technical concept then we can talk about it but right now it's it's not even something i feel like we can talk about because it it's so poorly defined because it's not a concept that anybody seems to have used until relatively recently yeah yeah all right uh next question so this is from elise on twitter uh, who says, what is the biggest mistake that most people make with relationship astrology? What are the commonplace myths that too many people fall for? So we already kind of talked about some of this when it comes mm -hmm. to like karmic relationships and twin flames. I'm trying to think if there's any other common things. Are there like timing things, for example, that have become myths or cliches or, or things that people take too far? Like I'm trying to think of. I, you know, for me, I I see that when pe uh, people have this idea like, oh, I'm going for, through a Venus transit, I'm going to fall in love. Venus mm. is not that strong, honey. No. A transit to your natal Venus, maybe. Um, a transit from like Venus in the sky is generally not strong enough. Mm -hmm. The thing about relationships and like a big misunderstanding that I see is that people think that relationships happen to you. Your relationships don't happen to you. You are an active participant in your relationships. And so there's a way that I think, first of all, we need to like count ourselves into the conversation. And second of all, I think that um I, I think that kind of waiting for the right time is is problematic, not only because it's passive, but because different relationships are good for different things. You know, mm -hmm. not all relationships need to end in marriage. You know, when I was looking through some of the Twitter questions, which I didn't see all of them, unfortunately, um, I noticed a lot of the questions were about like marriage and like, when mm -hmm. will I find the one? And, you know, not all relationships are meant to end in marriage. A relationship is not a failure if you end up breaking up. A relationship is only a failure if you don't learn from it, if you don't grow. And, the the work of being a human and you know we live really long now we like we really live a long time and through the magic and and gift of divorce i'm a very big divorce advocate um we don't have to stay with people we don't like you know what i mean and i mm -hmm. just think being able to recognize that you have free will and that you have choice and that you want to keep on growing and evolving ideally with someone who's your best friend who you want to bone forever but you know if that doesn't happen you can change your mind and change your life and to be open to that um, instead of being like, well, when am I going to find the person and when am I going to get there? Um, it's kind of a very, when I say an old school way of looking at things, I mean old school in that life used to be much shorter and we used to have mm -hmm. a lot more options and we used to have a lot more, uh, I'm sorry, a lot less options and a lot sure. less potential of, um, you know, kind of self-discovery. And so it's old school in that way because it's not acknowledging that we have more stimulation distracting us from our relationships and compelling us to grow and outgrow our relationships. It's a new world. And um, 
our kind of assumptions haven't caught up with that new world yet, you know? So I'll be really interested in like the kids who are in high school today, what kind of relationships they choose to have um, when they're, you know, in our age group, because I think that's, um, I think they will better reflect the kind of hyperstimulation of the world today, you know, and we just haven't caught up yet. Yeah. One of the things I'm really looking forward to, and I may not get to see, but it's like this generation is things have changed very rapidly, I feel like, in society in the past couple of decades, and different things that have been either taboo or that have been um, vilified or, or 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 marginalized in different ways have become less so, and certain battles have been fought and kind of won in terms of the culture wars or, or what have you. And I'm curious what things that are um, taboo or seen as bad or um, for whatever reason, marginalized today with like this generation that's still young now. Like, what are the things that will be the, the battles that will be fought like 40 years from now or something like that? Like, what will become something that's a point of contention that becomes commonplace or becomes normalized at some point in the future? That's like one of the things I sometimes think about that'll be interesting. Like, when we're old and, and outdated and like there's like concepts that we can't get on board with, like, what would that be? you know, 30 or 40 years from now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think um, it is really interesting to think about. And I also think it's hard to even conceptualize that without talking about climate change Uh, and, you know, acknowledging that people who are being born now are being born with Saturn and Pluto in Capricorn. They're being, they're going to, they're being born with Neptune and Pisces. You know, they, they are going to live through scarcity um, Mm. that we have not yet experienced. And, um, I think that you know this this veers us away from our center topic, so I won't I won't push us too far down this path. Sure. But I I do think that um, the children being born now um, are going to inherit an Earth that will reshape priorities around intimacy, around partnering, and around community in a really meaningful way. And I just realized that you and I are basically wearing the same outfit, and it's very cute. I want to get you a pair of red glasses immediately. Yeah, Sorry. Definitely. Sorry. <laughs> I just saw it, and I was incredibly charmed. <laughs> I know it's not that shocking, but still, it's cute. It's cute. We did it. I need a gold uh, necklace as well. Yeah, you do. I was going to say something. I was like, right. where's your gold chain? I, I know. I'm yeah. slacking. <laughs> you are um, slacking. <laughs> I'm, and I meant to say at the beginning, like I, I'm surprised and I asked you at the beginning of this if anybody had ever called you uh, j because that's just like the immediate like nickname I want to give you because there's like Jay, Jay Law, there's Jay Low, and I think j would be like a great nickname, but you said nobody's nobody's done that? Nobody's come it's up with that? It's because I'm in an abusive relationship with the world, and, okay. and that's really the only reason why, and you're the only person who sees me clearly. Obviously, I've always wanted a nickname, but I don't get one. Nobody, nobody, you know, I'm like a three syllable name girl. You know what I mean? I'm like, sure. my name has like 700 syllables in it. So I want everyone to learn from you and call well, me Jalen. And people, and I made this mistake and I apologize, sometimes mispronounce your name, which is also unfortunate, right? Or occasionally. Oh, I don't mind. Yeah, I don't okay. yeah, People always mispronounce it. But okay. I see, I came up with the name for my website, lovelanyato.com. Uh, mm. Before the internet was really a thing, like I didn't, I certainly didn't use it. I was still using my 1989 Packard Bell laptop where I just ran my solar fire. That's all nice. I did with it. So I, I like created a web page and I called it lovelanyato.com. It was supposed, in my mind, it was like love, comma, lanyato, but you couldn't put a comma in the web address. Anyways, and so I kept it, big mistake, because now people have to actually say and spell my freaking last name, which is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, yeah. So nobody can pronounce my name. It's not phonetic. I'm not offended, but also it's Lanyato for, for those who are curious. That is slightly better though. That like my situation was uh I I got beat to my domain name name chrisbrennan.com by the other Chris Brennan who preceded me, who's a MMA fighter whose nickname <laughs> is Chris Brennan, the the West Side Strangler. Oh my uh, God. So my friends have uh, a, a, always gotten a kick out of that for the past ten years, and I've been fighting like the West Side Strangler in the like search rankings in Google. That is amazing, and Thank I you. feel almost sad that that's not your nickname. <laughs> right. I mean, you could be like the East Side Strangler and see how it goes. Right. I feel like I feel like it's pretty good. It's, I'll, <laughs> it's a I'll, good I'll, story. I'll work on that. <laughs> uh, so back to so the point you're just making. One thing I want to mm-hmm. say before we move on that about that topic, but one of the things I wonder about sometimes, and I have a strong suspicion that may come up at some point in the future, and I don't know if this is too weird or futuristic, but there's all these discussions about and predictions by like futurists about 
if um, artificial intelligence is possible, and if so, these like projections for like well, in the next like three to four decades, um, if it is possible, it may be discovered, and what that would mean for humanity and all these different things. And I just want to like put this out there that at some point in the future, there could be a scenario if that's even theoretically possible where there is questions about like human like AI relationships and different moral conundrums and different things that would come up surrounding that and then astrologers having to deal with that topic and i could see that as being an issue from like a sci-fi perspective of something that people would wrestle with if it ever did become like an actual issue i think i you know it, i think on some level uh the future is now and i think mm -hmm. on some level we are having like the beginnings of that as we have virtual relationships we right. never have any um face to face let alone in person contact mm -hmm. and on the other side of a screen maybe somebody completely different than the person you think you're engaging with and as we see that we see a uh, more and more what i would characterize as a neptunian dynamic where your interpersonal relationships are largely based on uh, projection mm -hmm. and fantasy and um i I wouldn't be surprised if we are moving in that direction because it certainly seems like we are moving in that direction. And I think, you know, within that, it is important to recognize that AI can be racist. It can be uh, heterosexist and misogynist. It can be ableist. I mean, it can be all kinds of things because AI is programmed by people. And the people who have the highest ranking roles in technology are by and large white, straight men. And, um, there is a real need for us to democratize who makes technology, who programs. And, uh, you know, if you're listening and you're like, I was thinking about becoming an engineer and I'm not a dude, I want to say, please do it. Do it. Take one for the team and just do it. Um, because we need more people um, who are who are creating these algorithms uh, to be diverse. We need more of a diverse team doing these things because otherwise we're going to have m much bigger problems uh, than the ones you're kind of like, speaking at, you know, um, it's something I think about fair, a fair amount. I don't sure. really consider myself a futurist, but, uh, I consider myself, uh, somebody who can see the near death experience in just about everything. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, and then finally, just one last thing about the main question about what mistakes people make in relationship astrology. I did want to say there's one generalization that non astrologers but people that just know like sun sign astrology maybe sometimes make and the idea that maybe there's just one sign that's compatible with your sign or or something like that like just assumptions that certain signs only get along with or can have romantic or long lasting partnerships with certain signs and that's just like objectively not the case like once you get into astrology long enough you'll see variations of people having long and satisfying relationships with all sorts of different combinations of signs and Absolutely. placements and planets and what have you. Absolutely. Strong, strong, agree, and like. And also, I'll, I'll just say like for my book, it's predicated on the idea that we do not date out of our sun. The sun is your identity and your will. And that's a part of where we partner from, where we we date from. But really, it, there's so much more. Saturn is your sense of longevity and commitment and normalcy. It's, it's you know, all that kind of stuff. We, mm -hmm. we date out of Venus, which is like uh, intimate and social connection. Um, Mars, which is like sexual compatibility, but also how you do things, like the pace at which you live. Um, mm. We need compatibility on all the levels, or at least we need our compatibility to kind of be somewhat equal on all the levels in order to have um, enough tension to keep it interesting and enough uh, compatible, like ease to make it sustainable. And that you cannot find out through your sun sign. You know, people, I was actually just at the high school, as I said yesterday, and one of the kids I was talking to, she was like, oh, thank God I don't have any cancer in my chart. And I was like, I bet just because you said that you have a bunch of planets in the fourth house. And she was like, I don't think so. And she pulled up her chart because it's 2019 and teenagers can pull up their birth charts. And lo and behold, four planets in the fourth house. Nice. The thing that you hate, the thing that you think is like a difficult thing is probably what you have in your chart and you just don't realize it. That's what I've come to learn. We only have strong feelings about certain signs when we have them prominent in our chart or we have them easily triggering our chart. So strong agree. Plus, plus, plus. Brilliant. I love that. <laughs> and and so could we do a breakdown like that? Because I'm curious if your breakdown is the same as mine. And I know you go into this a little bit in the book, but I would say like you look for sometimes like um, 
like Mercury um, and their relationship, let's say synastry wise or connections and relationships in terms of how the people communicate and maybe get along intellectually. Um, maybe Venus and Mars for how they get along physically or sexually in some instances. Uh, sun and Moon for how they might relate or get along on a more core, especially emotional level. On some level, how would you? That's usually how I do the breakdown. But how would you do that breakdown in terms of all of those different? How do you sure. categorize those? Yeah, and that is the whole book basically for okay. me. Like that's that is what the book does, um, mm -hmm. uh, and it does it through all the sections, right? So each of the topics. But for so for me, it's the sun wants wants us to be seen. Where we have the sun, we want to be seen as a whole being, and we want to be recognized. You know what I mean? In the, in the mm -hmm. nature of our sun, the moon, of course, is your feelings and your needs. How we want to be nurtured and how we seek to nurture others. Mercury is not just how we verbally communicate; it's how we process data. It's how we listen. And, you know, the way that someone is listening to me has everything to do with whether or not I feel cared for and respected. Um, Venus is a relationship to money um, and what we own, which is a huge part of long term committed relationships. What often breaks people up is disagreements around money and values around that sort of thing. It's also around um, sensual connection. So it's not like athletic doing it, but it's like uh, the sensual part of hooking up. Mars is about straight up fornicating. It's your pacing through the world. Um, and it's also how you fight. And whenever couples tell me that they don't fight, I get very nervous because Mars needs an outlet. You need to fight with someone now and again. Obviously, the way we fight needs to be healthy and fair in order for it to lead to a successful relationship. But everyone's annoying and everyone messes up. So you need Mars. Um, then I don't stop there because I'm obsessed with the outer planets. It is one of my deepest passions. I'm obsessed with the outer planets. So for me, Jupiter is um, our sense of resiliency, but also our sense of how we um, grow through life. Saturn, as I mentioned, is related to themes around monogamy and loyalty, sustainability, but also our relationship to fear and our relationship to shoulds. Um, and kind of like I'm responsible to you, you are responsible to me. It's also what other people think. Finally, we have Uranus, which is my sense of freedom and autonomy, my ability to individuate away from you or to change my life. Neptune is um, anxiety, and it's also a sense of romance and potential and spiritual connection. Uh, and then finally, we Pluto. Pluto is shame. Pluto is compulsion. If I hate myself, eventually I'm going to hate you. Pluto. Pluto is intensity. It's another planet that has to do with sex, but it's much more oriented around um, like the shame we hold around sex and the deep and driving compulsions we have. I would also say Saturn has to do with sex. It's more to do with repression and kinks, um, kinks that come from repression specifically. Um, mm. And so, and I could keep on going, but I'm just like cliff notesing it. Cliff notes. Yeah, no, this is okay, great. Cool. And so, Thank this you. is what if want, people want to learn more about that. That this is in your book. This is yeah. The whole premise of the book is so. There's an intro to each of those sections we talked about about the different topics of friends, uh, lovers relationships. And there's an intro on that topic. And then for each planet, there's an intro that explains that planet in the context of the topic. And then it goes that planet in a house, that planet in the, in each sign. So it really okay. breaks it down and it empowers the reader to see, let's say we're talking about Venus, Venus from every angle, the angle of a platonic relationship, the angle of a new TBD style relationship, and from a uh, like long-term committed relationship, whether it's monogamous or not. Um, and being able to kind of like look at a thing from multiple anger, angles, to me, is being able to have a more flexible and nuanced use of astrology, and which is, of course, like my whole shtick. I'm super into it. So yeah, that's all in the book. Awesome. That and that right there is great motivation for everybody to go out and buy the book and pre-order the book right book, away. That's it right there. It's really cute. Oh, it's right there on your yeah, back. Yeah, it's shelf. right there awesome. on my little wall. Yeah. It's uh, hold on, can I pull? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, grab I can, it. Can Careful I, okay, with your hold, head, hold headphones. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wait for it. Um, I have exactly one copy of this book, but I awesome. look at that. Look at, it, nice. It, thank you. It's so got a little gold beautiful. to match my tooth. I love it. And the Thank layout's you. great. And you actually co you had a co-author on the book, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. I have a co-author because I don't enjoy writing, believe it or not. Okay. I write all the live long day and I do not enjoy it. So um, this woman, T. Greenaway, who's amazing, she <laughs> did the amazing task of uh, 
writing what I spoke. So I spoke the book and she mm. wrote it and then we collaborated on the edit of it. Um, and um, she she helped me so much because I I have all this data in, in this head of mine, you know? Mm. I'm just like a big data machine and I'm not a scholar. So I don't take notes on my data. I just have it. Um, and what has been really wonderful is, you know, she helped me to structure the data in a way that people could actually use. Mm. Um so it was it was a really interesting process because there really wasn't research to be done. It mm. was just like, you know, uh pulling out the data and organizing it effectively. Right. Um, yeah, and, and that's common with so many astrologers like that's one of the things that's so hard is you do tons of consultations and you'll learn a bunch of really interesting things in every consultation, but then afterwards we don't turn around and like immediately write it down. It just like sticks in your brain in some instances as a Piece of collected knowledge that you sort of have somewhere there in the background, but it's not usually written down like right away. Yeah, absolutely. And I've I've experienced in uh, teaching or lecturing to other astrologers at astrology conferences. I've been in situations, luckily not too often, but I've been in situations over the years where people are like, "Well, how do how do you know that mm -hmm. from looking at that aspect?" And I'm like, "Because I do. Like, I can't. Right. I, I. It's hard to like break down the methodology." So. Um, so, so my co-author was instrumental in being like, no, no, you actually have to explain this. And she like right. slowed me down because I may be a triple Capricorn, but I'm very Uranian. So I, I have a hard time with the slowing down sometimes. Uh, so she, yeah. So that was a really wonderful process. And if you're a person who doesn't like pictures, you'll hate this book because it's got very cute pictures in there sometimes. So nice. yeah, uh, buy it, love it, hug it. If you're anything like me, you'll hug the book because it's very huggable. Yeah, it looks um, comfortable. Uh, yeah, I would say thank you. for like, yeah. That's that's exactly what the goal was. Um, you know, when okay. we designed it, we were thinking something that you could put in a tote bag and bring with you to the mm. park and write okay. like right along the margins. I mean, if you want to get it for Kindle, I respect you. But this is the kind of book I hope that people take notes in. You know what I mean? Okay. And like bring and um. Because the way I, like I said, the way I use the fundamentals of astrology, it's like you can return to it over and over again. And when you have a deeper sense of a, a kind of assimilated, synthesized knowledge, then you can build and the same data becomes a whole new piece of information. So, mm -hmm. okay, that was it. I did. It was, a, it was meant to be a rainbow. Brilliant. I you saw that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, how are we? We're at one hour and 47 minutes. How are you for time? And when do we need to wrap this up? Do you want to do a few That's more questions or should we start to... Wind I down any anger, uh, angry messages. Let me do you mind if I just do a quick text? Because, uh, let me make sure. Yeah, go ahead. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna, I forgot to mention, I wanted to mention a few other episodes. If anybody wants to learn more about relationship stuff from past podcast episodes, I've done a few good ones. We were just talking about outer planets. So I wanted to mention episode 67 I did with Kay Taylor, who I think is also a San Francisco based astrologer, where we talked about the outer planets and relationships. And that was one of my favorite. Sort of back catalog episodes I'd recommend. Um, episode 128 was on composite charts with the originator of the technique, John Townley. Wow. And then, yeah, that was a big one. I was so glad I got to do that. I've been wanting to for years. And then we actually, with the guy that came up with the technique. So that's a good one. And then finally, episode 165 was with John Green on the topic of synastry and some of the work he's done on the astrology of relationships by looking at, at synastry. So we've sort of covered it. This is my final like relationship episode where we're really yeah. rounding it out. That's awesome. Um, okay, I can keep going. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a question uh, from Twitter from Astro Girls uh, at Astro G R L Z. They say, uh, I would love to hear more about relationships and astrology, specifically looking at queer relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more of a topic than a question, but I hope that they are able to touch a bit on it. And so I know we touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering, is there anything um, that's relevant that you can say to speak to that that is different or unique or important to keep in mind, or is really your approach to f to create an astrology that's broad enough and archetypal enough that it can be applied to any context, mm -hmm. regardless of one's you know, orientation or anything else? Yeah. Um, so there's the queering of astrology, mm -hmm. and then there's queer uh, people, right? And sure. the queering of astrology is not making assumptions. It's holding space for sexuality being a continuum. It's holding space for a greater sense of, um, sorry, 
um, a greater sense of agency within each individual in a relationship. That is, to me, the queering of relationships, uh, of relationship astrology. And so that's partially asking a client, like, why do you want to get married? You know, you want kids? Why? Why do you want kids? You sure you want kids? Mm -hmm. Um, That, to me, is what queering astrology is. It's simply being more inquisitive and holding space for individuation. Now, in terms of looking at gay astrology, um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Astrology is astrology. I mean, Gay shit is totally different than straight shit, and gay shit and straight shit's the same exact thing. They're both true. Um, and I think for me as a queer person um, who has counseled, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of straight people as well as queer people, um, mm-hmm. the astrology is the same. Intimacy issues are the same. What's different is the world, you know? What's different is the world will will respond to a queer partnership differently than a straight one. Um, and that... and, and you know, our rights and entitlements and our safety around love and intimacy is totally different. What we have to consider as queer people around how family will respond to our relationships is utterly different than what straight people experience. Having to justify your life choices is something that gay people have to do and straight people do not. Um, And so, you know, I mean, what straight person has been asked, when did you know you were straight? How did you know you were straight? But every gay person has been asked that shit. So being able to understand the cultural differences impact our charts and are reflected in our charts, but they are not our charts. Those are cultural differences that are projected onto us and not our innate nature. Does that make sense what I'm saying is a difference? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it raises a question that I've had, which is to what extent, like when you read some of the like 1970s relationship delineations in books, there'll be occasional like throwaway lines about queer relationships, but it'll usually be something like, because for example, the planet Uranus is usually associated with that which is, or has become in modern astrology associated with that which is um, out of the ordinary or is not normal in some way or is unique or can sometimes be labeled as like weird in some way. Oftentimes, like queer relationships would get sort of dumped under Uranus in like 1970s yeah. um, astrology books of like, oh, if you've got like a Venus Uranus conjunction or something like that. Um, and I was wondering to what extent, um, like over the past couple of decades, as uh, gay relationships have become more normalized in society and we've had the uh, legalization of gay marriage, for example, how long does stuff like that continue to be even true or relevant versus does the normalization of it take it outside of that realm of being something that should be seen by astrologers as Uranian uh, in some way? Mm-hmm. If, I think if you it's understand still Uranian. That, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think okay. it's still Uranian to be. So there's so there's a couple parts to this. So one is let's talk about the word queer for a moment because mm-hmm. um, I'm 45 years old, and when I was coming up in the 1990s in San Francisco, we used the term queer to mean not just gay but counterculture. Uh, okay. It's like queer as in anti-capitalist, queer as in anti-establishment. So it wasn't just homosexual. It was homosexual and counterculture. Now I've noticed, uh, and this is like a cultural shift in language, queer is not so much about values. It's about not straight. It's different. It's not necessarily homosexual. Um, it's about not being heterosexual. It's holding space. A lot of people are queer identified. They don't necessarily live a gay life at all. Um, They just hold, you know, they have had gay experiences or they have queerness in their sexual nature or within their gender identity. And that's a shift in the culture and in the language. And I think it's uh, Uranian on its own, right? Um, So are are you defining it, would it be accurate to say then that you're defining queer as that which is outside of the social norm or is that not okay framing it in that. Is that what, how you're trying to frame it? or I think that that's how it was used. I, okay. I don't know that that's exactly how it is used anymore. And this is why I mentioned my age, because I, I notice different uh, generations use that word, lots of words, but that word in different ways, you know? Sure. And, and um, I now know lots of people who are much younger than me who um, use the term queer. And what they mean is actually something very different than what I've meant when I've used the word queer, um, right. but it's all queer, man. And that's kind of cool too. It's all very Uranian. It's like hard to pin down many, like a multitude of identities and uh, definitions is so Uranian. So there's mm. that. Now, the other thing is, yes, gay marriage is legal, um, but barely. 
right? Sure. And not for very long. And right. um, I don't have a great deal of confidence if we keep a Republican uh, government that it's going to stay legal. Um, well, and, and, and not in every part of the world. That you, just absolutely. because it is has been for a few years here, that's not necessarily the case like worldwide. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And kind of associated with that, you know, within the umbrella of queer are trans people. And trans people are le like under attack, both in terms of their physical safety, but also in terms of legality, like the government comes for them in a particular way that they mm -hmm. don't currently come for um, binary gendered uh, gay people. Um, and, and so that's really important. When we're talking about queerness, we're not talking about gayness exclusively. We are talking sure. about gender identities. And so essentially my experience of Uranus is that it is about the eccentricities and it's about mm -hmm. what is outside of that Saturnian. Um, the clock says it's 4.05 and 27 seconds and that's what it is, right? Like mm -hmm. it's outside of that. And Uranus, I think in that way, yes, it wins a lot of queer points. You know, however we define queer, whether we do it in that like homo way or we do it in that like anything anything under the lgbtqi uh umbrella and i might be even missing letters uh forgive me if i am um and so so queerness is is uranian in nature i think it is also neptunian in nature um in 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 that it is queerness encompasses being outside of binary and outside of rigid structure and expectations and in that way it is deeply neptunian i can make an argument for pluto um, although I don't think it's necessarily that I, I could make an argument for Pluto, but I think Neptune and Uranus, um, are good planets to seek when looking at queerness. And I think, um, I think that it's, it's interesting because, you know, from personal experience as a, a person, I don't know how old I was when I came out, I must've come out in like 91 or something like that. Um, I, I have lived through a lot of changes um, and I'm still mm. quite young. Um, I've lived through a lot of changes around gay rights um, and gay culture itself, but also um, how straight culture responds to gay culture. Um, I can speak to a room of majoritively or exclusively straight people and out myself as queer and people don't blink anymore. They used right. to blink. They used to blink rapidly. Um, and now, you know, there's, there's that difference. And, um, you know, I can be very comfortably out about the fact that my partner is trans and um, it doesn't, you know, there's conversation that can happen. Some of that's because if someone's like, wait a minute, what does that mean? They can Google it. And that's new, right? In the mm. culture, that's new. I will say, though, um, I am partnered with a very uh, like passing uh, trans man and he's white and he has beautiful blue eyes. And I am experiencing what I didn't know existed. I mean, I knew, but I didn't, I never experienced it before. Uh, mm -hmm. Straight privilege. It is divine. It is so easy to be a straight person. OMG. I have no idea. Like I technically knew, but as a person who's like lived my life, my whole life as a, as a queer person and been with uh, visibly gay women, mm -hmm. um, even though I'm not necessarily like a visibly queer person, uh, just by looking at this. Uh, yeah. We go to the county fair. It's just sunshine and candies and like <laughs> invitations to the ball. It's really right. different. So in that way, I will say as a person who's like all of a sudden experiencing a lot of straight privilege from within my incredibly queer relationship, um, it's still very much not the same, you know? And, and so I'm not sure, Astro Girls, if we're fully answering your question, um, but I think with astrology, it's more about queering astrology as opposed to seeing um, planets as gay or straight. It's more about querying your your viewfinder as you approach astrology and and how you use it. Sure. Yeah. yeah and, and some of this is so has happened so recently in society, like um, you know, gay rights just in the past couple of decades, like two or three decades tops, or now the conversation surrounding trans rights, especially in the past decade. And I just I wonder in like a century or two. Like where we're just like long past, and let's just assume that the trajectory that things are on continues, and there's just further normalization and everything else. If I don't know, at any point that will be outside of the scope of that which is deemed as Uranian, if it's been normalized to such an extent, or if it will still always be associated in that way. It's just one of the questions I've had. Yeah. But do you feel like in a century or two when we're like long past some of the battles that are happening now that it will still be in, in that way? 
I don't think we're going to be long past those battles. I don't think, okay. I don't think, I, I wish I had the, that kind of optimism. Um, sure. I think for as long as we have institutionalized religion um, and a vested interest in uh, families between one man and one woman making 2.3 babies or whatever, for as long mm -hmm. as we have that, it it is tricky um, for gay rights. I mean, religion is not an encompassing enveloping place for queers for the most part and not exclusively there's lots of you know uh religions that are embracing but it's more like sex as opposed to like the whole damn thing um i think also queer rights are wrapped up in women's rights um, because a lot of homophobia is essentially hatred of women and not wanting women to have space uh and rights within the world um and i don't see us making great strides in that way per se and again, not to be that boner killer, but I do have concerns about what climate change will do and, you know, water insecurity and like, uh, you know, the continued refugee crises. I don't know that we are moving into a more progressive time in human history. Um, if I will do my utmost to to be a part of the effort for it to be more of a, a progressive time, but I don't, I like your vision of in, in a century will be, you know, beyond all this gender binary bullshit sure. and will all be about free will. But I, I fear that we'll be living on a charred earth and there'll be like 13 of us. And we'll be trying to rebuild with a horse right. and a buggy or something. So <laughs> I'm and, not and the hopefully one to like, talk to. And hopefully like a copy of your book. Like we were talking, we were joking earlier that- if That's right. Just one, this in the breeze, this in the breeze. <laughs> right. If one one astrology book survives, hopefully it, it is your, your relationship book. Very kind. So kind. Way right. too kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to mention really quick, I forgot to mention there was one other relationship episode that's actually relevant in my back catalog to this, which is one that was important. I did a discussion with Christopher Renstrom oh, in episode I love 70. Him. Yeah, Christopher is amazing. He's been on the show, I think, two or two or three times, but this is episode 79 that was on sexual orientation and astrology. And the question and debate that sometimes comes up in the astrological community over whether you can whether an astrological chart can tell you or say anything about sexual orientation. And people have very strong like opinions on either side of that, and the purpose of that discussion was kind of to explore both sides of that that sort of debate in that episode. Mm -hmm. That's it's a I would yeah it's a very important debate. Sure. Do you have mm -hmm. any strong? Do, do, do you want to go there? Or? Sure. I mean, I think okay. you know Venus Uranus Mars Uranus Moon Uranus they're all hella queer, um, and that doesn't mean they're gay. And again, yeah. we're back to gender roles uh, more than we are about sexuality. So there's right. that. The other thing I think is uh, there is no value or merit in using the birth chart to predict homosexuality or heterosexuality. And mm -hmm. you know nobody's trying to predict heterosexuality. Sure. It's It can be too easily used as kind of um, used poorly uh, and used unethically by sure. people who are not necessarily very gay positive or, you know, uh, trans positive. Mm -hmm. And I, I think... As astrologers, there's nothing wrong with a little humanity and a little common sense. Ask a person who they like. And if something in their chart gives you a little inkling that maybe they are queerer than they think they are, than they said they are, say, have you ever considered people of a different gender, the same gender? And um, the, the answer is often, yeah, but dot, 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 you know? Um, a lot of people know that they're gay. A lot of people know that they're queer and are choosing to not live that way because of what other people will say or think or do. And that's just fear. And fear can be traced in the chart to Saturn or Neptune. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one area that came up in my discussion with Christopher that was kind of relevant in terms of sometimes terminology that might be used in the gay community that might be relevant and have like an astrological context is like terms like um, like bottoming and top versus being a top, and you, yes. do you think that's like relevant things that can be integrated successfully oh, into astrology? H hugely, I mean, a huge part of what comes up in my sessions with um, straight people is, mm -hmm. you know, within queer qu with with queer sex, with gay sex, not just queer, like gay sex. Um, we often use the term top and bottom, and there's mm -hmm. this um, questioning of everything. There's a talking about everything, whereas in heterosexual dynamic, historically, it's like men do sex to women, <laughs> and sure. that's no, that's not, that's not modern. That's not a consensual, fun thing to do in general for people. So when we talk about topping and bottoming, it's so freeing because you know women come in and they're like, yeah, my boyfriend never initiated sex, and I don't know, maybe he doesn't like me. I don't know what's going, what's wrong. 
And I'm often like, well, maybe he's just a bottom. Maybe he just needs you to sexually like initiate sex. And more right. often than not, that's the issue. It's that mm-hmm. not all men are tops and not all women are bottoms. Not all men want to have to initiate sexual contact or things in life in general. And that is not a bad thing. That's not unmasculine. It's just we are all wired in whatever ways. And this is what I'm talking about with queering astrology and queering the conversation. It's about recognizing that it's not just gay people that are tops or bottoms. It's people. It's just that gay sure. people have language for it. And what right. I I was actually, I spoke on a panel about sex, posit- sex and sex positivity um, recently in, for HBO in LA with a couple of women. And this was something that we talked about there is that, you know, queer people have had to come up with language, our own language to explain um, gender and sexuality in in a different way outside of like the heterosexual or like the heterotypical uh limited model. And what I'm seeing within the world of sex positivity at this time and the greater accessibility and acceptance of queerness is that um, straight people in straight culture are using more of that languaging and having access to more of that wisdom, which I think is really wonderful. The only kind of risky part of it is when there's two people and they're of the same gender, then there's a baseline of power that is shared. And when there's a boy-girl dynamic, there is a power inequity straight out the gates, regardless of everything else, because men have a different kind of power in the world. And that is an undeniable thing. We can look at men's wages, men's safety, um, violence from men to women versus from women to men. Um, And so being able to recognize that we want to be able to use the wisdom and the languaging of queer stuff for straight people, but without losing track of the differences, because the differences are real and worth acknowledging and and honoring. Yeah, or another fun differentiation that comes to mind is like interrelation interracial relationships and how um that could create inequities as well or you could Absolutely. And and sure. so when we look at race, when we look at class, um when we look at age differentials, you know, mm-hmm. we can we can trace this down a lot of different um kind of inequities or it's not Mm -hmm. really inequities it's differences and those differences within the context of a society become inequities they're not inherent inequities and i think looking at nature versus nurture is really essential when using the birth chart as a guide you know and and i think hopefully again astro girls we've touched on what you're asking about because we've kind of like taken it in directions but right. i think they're good directions yeah no that's great and i think one of the points you brought up is just that in um some of the language that's been developed um surrounding discussions about queer sexuality there's a lot more nuance and there's integration of languages that allows for more of a spectrum in terms of sexuality and different things and that is completely and totally could be useful and contextualized within the context of astrology and integrated and used in very positive and very constructive ways. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um there's a bunch of other questions and I, I'm actually really enjoying this. So I would keep going all day, but I don't want to hold you. So where are you at? We're at two hours and eight minutes. Oh snap. I can go up to up to 30 minutes okay. more. Okay. Yeah. If theoretically Yeah. yeah. Okay. If, if, and and I'll let you know if something changes. Um, and it's just that I'm also having fun. It's the tragedy. One sec. Oh yeah. No, I think we're in good shape. I think we're going to, I think we're in good shape. Let's try it. All right, let's do it. Let's hit some rapid fire questions. This one, I don't know okay. if this is a good one. Oh wait, one. really briefly. Can I just ask you, I, it's Please. darkening in California very briefly. Do you want me to turn on a light or is this okay? Um, I mean, this is really cool because you have the the sign in the background and it's just creating this awesome ambiance. Okay, great. I'm fine with it too. I like I like the darkness. I'm just trying to I'm trying to be considerate to the people, you know. So okay, no, great. Let's do rapid fire. All right, here we go. Uh so I don't know if this so this is from Ash Bash at Astro underscore Ashley Eleven. She asks about marriage elections. I don't know if you do this. Do you do electional astrology for marriages at all? Do you do electional in general? Uh, I, I, I mean, I'll mess with it a teeny bit, but certainly not for marriages. No. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's skip that Wait, let me just say really briefly why, if I may. Okay. Um, listen, the wedding is usually what people are asking about, but the decision to get married is when the marriage begins. It's not the wedding. Okay. Yeah. It's not the wedding. Like the, let's say quote unquote proposal, proposal, if there's like a formal proposal. Yeah. The agreement. 
That's okay. We, let's say you and I are getting married. We get we, we got engaged. We're fiance. We're getting we're getting married. Okay, so now okay. we've decided we're getting married, and now right. we're in the beginning of our marriage, essentially. Right. So I don't believe the church does it. I don't believe the government does it. Okay. Um, I, I think those are parts of it, and we can cast charts for those things, but the marriage begins with the decision to be partnered. Okay, what so about already this? I, I know this is another question. I can't remember. I can't find who asked it. I'll, if I can find it later, I'll mention it. Oh, no, here it is. It was from Astro Academic at Academic Astro on Twitter who asks, do you also consider the first meeting election if you have it when doing a synastry reading? Do you look at first meeting charts? Um, I don't do synastry readings. And no, absolutely no. No with first, the meeting. first meetings. Okay. No, okay. I mean, to what end? Again, this is just more information. But mm -hmm. what is this information doing? How is this information helping you to be present? And to get to know the person and let them reveal themselves to you and to make sure you're showing up, not so that they like you, so that you're being authentic. Like, how do all these charts help that? In my sure. view, they don't. So I don't do any of those things. And when people okay. ask for that, I say no. I was just thinking if because you could conceptually make an argument there that the the chart of the relationship may be arguing along the lines that you were saying that if that you've already proposed, then you're symbolically already pretty much there. Uh, if you've accepted, um, that maybe even going further back, once you started the relationship itself, you're already in a relationship, Correct. and so maybe that inception chart already has the greater authority. Plenty of things we could talk about, but let's let's move yeah. on. Okay. So um, let's see the next question. This is from um, at uh, Aya Nathan Nath Oracle. Sorry, if I'm butchering that, I'll put it in the description. Who asked, could you talk about the history of whoever decided that astrological compatibility was strictly based on the element of the sun sign? Do you have any strong feelings about that in terms of sun sign astrology for, I don't know, synastry or as the sole basis of like relationship compatibility? Mm. I don't know anything about the history of it. Uh, yeah, I am I'm not a fan of it. Uh, I mean, I bet Annabelle Gatt, who just wrote a great sun sign compatibility book, would probably have stuff to say about that. But I, um, I don't know a damn thing about that. And honestly, I don't pay attention to sun signs, but at all. I mean, you'll hear me talk about being a Capricorn because I'm sun, moon, and rising in Capricorn. It's a little bit of like a badge I wear. Um, but I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if a person has like a stellium, I feel like they have more of a right to yeah. rep represent and like yeah. really ident identify with that sign. <laughs> Totally, yeah. I, okay. I definitely I agree with that. But Wait, I, have, it's it's not just telling you have sun, moon, and rising. Is that what you just said? Yes. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah. Okay. So you're like yeah. a super Capricorn. I'm like a Capricorn on crack. If that crack okay. was Saturn, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> and, and where is what sign is Saturn in? Saturn's in Cancer, opposite my sun. Oh, the and opposite moon. sign. Okay. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good I'm times. Very, I'm I'm what they call super easygoing uh, and chill. That's sarcastic. It's not true at all. Uh, I'm I just it. very is, is Saturn in the seventh in, in your Placidus Six. chart? Six. It's in yeah. your sixth I'm a, I'm a 12th okay. house uh, triple cap. All right. I'm just going to put this out there. I know you said yeah. this at the beginning of the show, that it's not your preference, but in the whole sign house system, your Saturn mm -hmm. would be in the seventh house of relationships. And you just published what I believe is your first book on relationships. I'm just going to put that all out there. All those things are true. All those things okay. are true. Just, but, but let right. me put out there, I also okay. have a grand trine between Saturn, my midheaven, and Jupiter. Okay. Which would do that anyways. Sure. Okay. So I'll take I mean, that. I mean, you know, and this is uh, okay, and this is a little off topic, but let me just share. Please. I have only ever had one astrology teacher, uh, Mr. Mike Boyle. He taught me in Montreal, Quebec, when I was in this alternative college for, um, you know, whatever. It's how I learned astrology at first, and he said these are all the houses. Uh, these are all the house systems. Run your chart and all the house systems. He was mm. also a Capricorn. He's like, run your chart and all the house systems, study your chart and all the house systems, and decide which one is true, and then stick with it forever. And just stick and with it, yeah. by God, I've done that. So for me, it's Campanus houses, which is the furthest from whole sign houses that you can get, literally, because okay. what... Campanus does is it gives you a lot of interceptions. It gives you the most wonky of all the house shapes. Hmm. Um, I'm really passionate about interceptions. I think they're incredibly um, nuanced, detailed data, especially around prenatal conditions, which is one of my other specialties. Um, and so for me, um, the Campanus house system is the only one that puts Mars in my 12th house versus Mars in my 11th. I am nobody's idea of Mars in the 11th house. I am a goddamn hermit. So Your for Mars me, is in... Um uh, whatever Scorpio. 
uh, Sag. It's in Sag. Okay, got it. Yeah, and yeah. You... My Mars is in Sag, and in all house systems, it's in the eleventh house, except for Campanus, where it's in the twelfth. And I'm very much a textbook Mars in the twelfth house person. Okay. So I have other planets in the eleventh, but in, in any case, so for me, I just went with Campanus, stuck with Campanus, and um have even a beautiful gift from the astrologer Tony Howard sitting right here on my desk and it says intercepting a house near you. I am obsessed with interceptions. Nice. So yeah, so I, I'm very pro Campanus houses. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Campanus. And that was I think Campanus was also the system that Rudyar used. I want to say they're like was if it? I'm not I I think so. I could be totally off base there and I'm sure listeners will let me know if I was. I'm but, sure they will. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um Let's see. Before we move on from that point, you mentioned Annabelle's book, who was going to join us but couldn't make it today. And her book is another amazing book um, along similar lines. It's titled "The Astrology of Love and Sex: A Modern Compatibility Guide." So people can also check that out if they're looking for more of like a relationship-oriented type astrology book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a sun sign compatibility uh, book, and it is pure Annabelle, so it's excellent. Definitely. Yeah. All right, and also very cute. Yeah, if you're also, in the market for cute things as as well as high quality things. It's both also well illustrated and also like yours, a book that you would probably want to like cuddle up with, which yes. is what I was actually saying earlier. And then yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Agree, agree, agree. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. So um let's see. Next question. No, that's another karmic soul relationship type question. Uh another one about sinister and composites. Um what do you look for in a casual Relationship versus long term from at learning Taurus. I guess you've sort of touched on this already, like mm -hmm. things like Saturn, for example, or I mean, for a short term relationship or a casual relationship, it depends on what your goal is. I mean, right. So let's say you're hypoth. Well, no, I'm not going to go there. Go ahead, continue. Well, Sorry. I would, I would say this: if your ambition is to like, you know, have some dates, have some sex, um, and not let it get too far. I'm not going to focus on the astrology compatibility. Why would I do that? Instead, I'm going to focus on your birth chart. It's if you're not trying to be in a serious relationship with someone, don't treat them like your best friend. Don't text them every day. Don't have sleepover parties. Don't snuggle and go for groceries. Like don't drink coffee with them. That's what you do with your partner. Instead, you know, if you're if you want someone to be a trick, treat them respectfully, joyfully, like a trick. You know, and there's nothing I hope that doesn't sound like a negative. To me, that's a positive. It's about you know, not every friend is your best friend. Some friends you just go out to like concerts with and not sure. every lover is meant to be your partner. And so don't treat someone who is a lover like a partner. And that's on you in your birth chart. You don't need to worry about someone else's birth chart if they're not your best friend or your partner. Hmm. Friends, listen to that. If someone is casual, don't focus on their damn chart. Because as soon as you focus on someone else's chart, you're treating them as something less than casual or more than casual. Um, so it's all on you and your chart if you're wanting things to be cash, okay. is my attitude. Got it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have um, very strict, I mean, strict rules around this sort of thing. <laughs> and, I, and I guess I, I would say in some instances, like sometimes really casual, good, casual, um, purely sexual relationships might have really good or at least really intense Venus-Mars synastry, and maybe that describes that relationship. But if sometimes you... Um, there might be other things that might be important in a long-term relationship that you might need in order to give it permanent sort of long-term stability beyond just Venus and Mars in some instances. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, I would. I would. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I'll, I'll add to that. I don't think everyone fucks out of Venus and Mars, and sure. I think that this is an old-school astrology concept. Mm -hmm. um, Mars is the athletic part of sex, you know, mm -hmm. and people who are in their bodies will have sex out of their bodies. But a lot of times, you know, sexual relationships or casual relationships are predicated on a kink. And kinks aren't per se Mars or Venus, certainly not Venus. Kinks are the outer planets. I'm always looking to the outer planets for sexual perversion. And when I say sexual perversion, it is a positive, not a negative. Um, and so I, I think, you know, some people have sex out of their moon. They just want to be loved. They just don't want to be alone. And that's right. not a Mars form of sex. It's a form of sex of like, I want, I don't want to be lonely. And some people just want to be adored, you know, and I want to look more to Venus for that. Like, you know, if it's just like a, having sex with the mirror, I want to know what Jupiter's doing. I'm interested. And so I think, 
it's also when we when we fixate too much on the Venus Mars for sex, um, we miss out on a lot of data because again, we are complicated, messy, traumatized beings. And being complicated, messy, and traumatized means we are dealing with planets that technically shouldn't be the planets that govern a thing, but they happen to govern a thing. It's like if you um I was just boxing the other day. And it's like, if you throw a punch just out of your arm, but not out of your core muscles, your abdominal muscles, you're going to throw the punch wrong. You have mm. to use, uh, sometimes you have to use muscle groups that you wouldn't think are responsible for a movement in order to do the movement properly. And the same thing is true with the birth chart. You think you're moving with Mars, but really you're pulling out of your Saturn. And that's right. cool. And it's interesting. So don't limit uh, kind of like what you think is possible based on like the rulerships, like look at the more complicated nuance of your human condition is my attitude. I love that. That's, that's okay. an amazing point. And you mentioned Saturn in particular earlier in terms of like um, when certain kinks are coming from an area of like, like shame or, or other things like that is contributing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, different uh, ethnic or religious backgrounds uh, give you right. different kind of kinks. Uh, right. Different kinds of trauma or abuse give you different kind of kinks. Different kind of kinks give you different kind of kinks. Like not all kinks come out of trauma or repression or isolation or any of that kind of stuff. Some people are just damn kinky. And what is kinky? Like kinky is sex that is not, uh, you know, P and V sex. What? I don't know. I mean, like it's just, that seems really boring too. Like we have to expand what we I, what we even conceive of as perversion or kinky. And I think that as we do that, we don't stop using that language. We more change the the value and the meaning behind that language. You know, I mean, when I say kinky, when I say perverted, when I say filthy, I'm there's no negative connotation. But I feel like I always have to clarify that because most people use those words as negative. Um, my queer ass does not. So you know, it's about being able to expand our value around sex and sexuality, and to understand also that a lot of times what an individual desires sexually is not what they're doing, right? Because their partner doesn't want to do it because they think it's bad, because they're inhibited in whatever way. And um, and I think that that's also really an important part of being able to look at the chart. Now, I want to say to people who are listening, do not mm. listen to this and start looking at your crush's chart or your partner's <laughs> chart, trying to divine what they secretly want in bed. That is not right. That is right. where you use your mouth and you talk to someone. You say, hey, what do you like? What do you want? And you listen to their answer. And if they say they like or they want something that you don't like, don't say, ew. Just be like, okay, cool. I'm not sure about that or whatever. And then, you know, explore from there. Yes, or do not just like show up and start doing something, assuming from somebody's chart. Uh, yeah, have that conversation yeah. ahead of time verbally. Mm -hmm. um, you have to come back, and we have to do an episode at some point. I don't know if this will work, and this could go terribly wrong. But an episode <laughs> of like the astrology of kinks would be a great discussion topic if dealt with proper, dealt with properly. Which Agreed. Tap me in, coach. I'm, okay. I, 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 tap me in. I'm in. I'm in. I mean, I, it'd be interesting to bring a bunch of different kinds of astrologers or different kinds of humans who happen to be astrologers in for that too. But right. I, it's something I'm really passionate about because working with queer people, um, being somebody who I am myself very sex positive, um, mm. and I'm very open and not judgmental around sex and sexuality. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people um, about sex over, you know, the past couple decades of me being a practicing astrologer. And, and I, I have a lot to say about it. And I have not really explored this topic um, in astrology, like chat groups and stuff like that, because I'm not really interested in um, having, I mean, honestly, anytime sex comes up and women start to have a part of the conversation, you open yourself up to men attacking you or shaming you or getting weird and like turned on by it. And so sure. I'm not interested in that, but I'd be interested in having that conversation and kind of giving information to people. And I would want to say that if you have strong opinions or strong feelings in response, do not attack the astrologer you are hearing speak. Just disagree. You can sure. disagree in your own mind, guys. It doesn't always have to be on Twitter. <laughs> it can just be yeah. in your thoughts. <laughs> I, I like that recommendation as the in theory, but in terms of whether we could pull that off, um, let's let's talk about it in the sure, future sure, and see, sure, yeah. see what we can do. Okay, um, let's do one last question really quick and then wrap it up. Great. Um, 
this is tied in actually to some extent with the last episode I did, uh, which was this big debate about whether it is okay to practice astrology prior to your Saturn return. And this is almost mm. sort of vaguely in the same vein. So I wanted to put it out there. It's um, from somebody on Twitter named Chelsea at a uh, complicated Twitter username. And she says, I'm curious about what is in store for those folks entering their Saturn return single in regards to relationships. Should we avoid dating? Or do you have any tips or suggestions for dating during your Saturn return? Great questions. And I have to just ask, is their Twitter handle complicated Twitter name? Or are you just saying it was a complicated Twitter name? Um, I don't know how to pronounce it because it's okay, a few I've... different words, but it's A-E-S-L-E-H-C-O-T-H-T-R-A-E, which I might was just be like... hoping that their actual handle was complicated. Be, yeah, that would be a really good handle, Honestly, actually. if somebody hasn't already taken that handle, I hope one of you listeners do that right now because you will be my hero. Definitely. Um, okay, so two parts to this question. Um, the first one is about practicing as an astrologer before your Saturn return. You know, historically, oh, you, that wasn't- you, a, You're going to go there? You am wanna, I not allowed to? No, you can go there. I just okay, remember- because we almost did this discussion before, or uh -huh. you almost, but it sounded like you didn't want to get into it. Oh no, no, I'll get into it. Okay. Oh yeah, I was a practicing astrologer when I was twenty. You know. Okay, and, so you started and... seeing clients already, like mm -hmm. seven, eight years before your Saturn return. When did oh, you? Yeah. How, how young were you when you started studying astrology in general? Um, I was seventeen when I was studying under a teacher. Okay, so yeah. you. Got, I was okay. young. I was young. Um, and you know, I I shall I I should also say you know I have uh, as a sun moon and rising all in one sign I have my part of fortune conjunct my sun and moon, um, so I came to my calling real young and I came with all the heaviness of Saturn right so it's not surprising that I would have started young, um, sure. but this is what I did um, and I actually was just on a panel a different panel last like two nights ago talking about this but what I did was I put myself in what I called a self appointed apprenticeship, and um, for the years leading up to my Saturn return. I would tell every client before I met with them that I was in a self-appointed apprenticeship. I was in the first decade of my practice as an astrologer and that um, they should know that, you know, I was competent and I wanted to help them. And also I was in the first decade of my practice. And I did that because I felt like it was an integrity for me to do. And mm -hmm. I did that because I wanted to create the room for me as a practitioner to grow into because I knew as an astrologer um, that before your Saturn return, you are, you haven't done it yet. You know, there's a lot of things you haven't done yet. And I don't mm -hmm. think there's any problem with being an astrologer before the Saturn return. I think there is a problem in posturing as though you, it doesn't matter that you haven't been through your first Saturn return because the Saturn return marks the beginning of your adulthood. And before your Saturn return, those years in your 20s leading up to it, it is the kind of like elder years of your youth. But it's your youth, and uh, the Saturn return marks the first adult cycle. And so um, there is a certain amount of maturity and integration and embodiment that can only happen through the transit of the Saturn return. And that doesn't mean don't practice. It means own it. Let your clients know that you're in the first decade of practice because, you know, it is a very, very new thing that astrologers can just like boop, boop, boop go on the internet and find a birth chart. You used to have to learn how to do right. that shit yourself. I was yeah, you used to like calculate it by hand. Yeah, that's how I was taught because okay. I didn't have access to a computer at the time. You know, um, I mean, there were computers in the early 1990s, but I didn't have them. You right. know? They were they were like the size of houses. And they were the size of yeah. houses. And like the first astrologer I met that had um, a computer, I ended up, I have it still actually. It's this big yellow box and it could only it was a dos prompt machine and okay. it could only hold the solar fire program in it you know and, right. and I, I used it for many years past when i should but it's another subject but in any case what i did was i told my clients that i was in you know i was in the early stages and i priced myself accordingly i didn't price myself in the same way as i would have if i was you know deep into my practice and i also I'm so grateful that I did that because now, you know, having been practicing for for you know a couple decades, um, some of my clients are still with me from those early years, and mm -hmm. I never feel embarrassed by what I did. I never feel like I did something that was in out of integrity because if I made mistakes, if I have evolved in my thinking, my clients knew that that's where I was coming from at the early stages of my work as an astrologer, and I think as astrologers who are 
both counseling people who are vulnerable, but also we are like stewards of time and maturity and development. It is a responsibility we hold to be transparent, not about our age, but about where we are, are at in relationship to uh, Saturn, because sure. Saturn is the one. So that's my take on that, if I, if I may hot take it. Brilliant. That was a like a way better and more concise. It took me like two hours to say the same thing in like the last episode. So you're light years ahead of me. Thank you very uh, much. Your, your main answer is really it's okay to practice prior to your set and return, but just be open and honest and, and yep. forthcoming about it. Hundred percent. And also, may I ask how old you are? I don't know. You just had a birthday. I just turned thirty five. Uh, Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, it's <laughs> it's a twelfth house perfection. It's a little rocky so far, but yeah, it'll, um, be, it'll be rocky. Yeah, yeah. But thirty five for me was when I felt like my life truly began. It was at my thirty fifth birthday. I was like, oh shit, okay, this is life. Mm. And you know, I'm a decade older than you, and um, that's why I can say it more concisely. That's the only reason why is because okay. time matters. And and I think that this is like I have dear friends who are in, uh, you know, who are much younger than me, who are astrologers and. Um, I'm excited about it. And and like I said, I was a practicing astrologer. I went full-time during my Saturn return. Um, and so I say, everybody, you know, jump in, just hold space for older you. Don't act like you're a master of something that you're in your beginning stages with. Mm -hmm. Now, to the to the questioner who had uh complicated Twitter handle.com, right. www slash no one can pronounce it. Um, this is what I think about Saturn return and dating. Uh, you know, I'm a triple Capricorn, so I got into a relationship that lasted almost a decade during my Saturn return. That was awesome. Uh, okay. Most people don't. Saturn is endings. Saturn is restriction. Saturn is heaviness. And so if you're looking to just like get laid and have someone tell you you're pretty, that is not likely to happen. Yeah. But if you're open to being in your, in your Saturn return, in your Saturn lessons, and you want to experiment with that in relationship to others, do your best. If you find that you're too easily demoralized or there's no flow, then maybe redirect your energies. But there's not a you should, you shouldn't. There's a find, locate yourself. If you have Saturn and Capricorn, if you're going through your Saturn return now, you have Saturn and Capricorn. If you have Saturn and Capricorn, it's about embodiment of your kind of um, your own wisdom. So use astrology as a guide, but also use common sense. And life experience as a guide too, you know, try it. And if it doesn't work, redirect, have authority over your own experience. That's what Saturn and Capricorn wants from you. Now, house and aspect depending, I might say some many other things, but that's my, that's my hot take on that question. I love it. That's great. And it, yeah, it's like you said, it's hard because there's no one answer that's going to fit all for this question because it's really going to depend on how your birth chart's set up. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like if you have Saturn in your seventh house, then being in a relationship may play a major role of your Saturn return or starting a relationship during that time. And you shouldn't just like avoid that or turn that down just because of some abstract idea that you have a transit and therefore you shouldn't start anything during that time because that could be a really important, like life defining turning point for you. And, you know, for people that have Saturn connected to their seventh house, it often is during their Saturn return, whether they're going into it in a relationship and maybe get out of a relationship during their Saturn return or lose a relationship or whether they're single going into it and then start a major relationship. I mean, it's just an important turning point. Yeah. And I would also uh, kind of add to that, you know, people get so fixated on the Saturn return, just like they get fixated right. on Mercury retrograde because they know what it is. But yeah. the truth is you could be going through the Saturn return and like five other transits. So you also want to pay attention to the other transits that you're going through at the time to see if there are things um indicating one way or another what's going to mm -hmm. happen. Um, and and I would also say, well, I guess I, I, I'll i shut up. That, that's what I'll say. No, um, no, go ahead. You can... I mean, you know, I was going to say all kinds of things actually about the Saturn return because I'm obsessed with the Saturn return because I'm so Saturnian. Right. Um, but I really, I, I will say like the, the Saturn return, the first Saturn return is really about coming into your own. And you know, my experience as I'm a Saturn in the sixth house person, you know, in my house system, and mm -hmm. I was incredibly sick. My whole Saturn return it was very, okay. very, very sick. My work life was a really big deal. But because relationships weren't the lesson of my Saturn return, I was able to manifest a relationship. Um, and it supported me in my work. And that person supported me in my work. And she supported me in um, in my health issues. And that was, you know, I was ready for that. And that's what happened. And um 
And I think that, you know, it really does depend on what your lesson is, you know? So I, like, I have a slightly different take on it than you do. Cause I'm, I'm, always looking at what is the primary lesson that Saturn is trying to beat you over the head with, because mm. whatever it is, you're not going to avoid it. But if relationships aren't the primary lesson of your Saturn return or one of those primary lessons, then it will be much easier for a relationship to come in if you're doing the work of embodiment and maturity and ownership of self, because that's what Saturn wants. Again, we're back to like the greatness of Saturn in that book. Saturn wants you to take responsibility for yourself. You seek a shortcut and Saturn's like, ha, I'm going to catch you at that shortcut because Saturn is a jerk. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and there's such a wide range of manifestations of like constructive Saturn return experiences versus just like really painful, heartbreaking, um, or traumatic Saturn return experiences. And where you're going to fall in that could be anywhere on either of those extremes or somewhere closer to the to the middle. Yeah, absolutely. Man, Saturn return was really rough for me. How about you? Was it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it could have been worse. I mean, I have a day chart, and I'm kind of like you, where my Saturn is very prominent in my chart, and had some rough stuff. But then there was also some constructive stuff at the same time. I definitely did not get like the worst case scenario of the Saturn return. I actually lost my hair. That was the point uh, at which I realized I was going, I was losing all of my hair, and, and had to start shaving it. So part of my Saturn return experience was. Redefining my sense of self because Saturn squaring my ascendant and my I was like, gonna a, ask. like appearance to the world and that was actually even though that sounds kind of stupid or minor was a major like ongoing process for like oh, a couple of massive. years for me. Yeah, sure. that's massive. I mean, Saturn on the ascendant will generally thin the hair or like make there be less hair. Mm. Um, so it's not surprising to me that that was like the coinciding, but it is so huge because it's how people see you and it's a marker of age and time, which is. Saturn, you know. Sure. I I definitely see with Saturn transits for women, you know, who are in their um like mid to late 30s and older that the kind of hormonal thing that normally happens of thinning or loss of hair um comes with those hard Saturn transits. I haven't tracked it as effectively with men, with cis men specifically. Mm. Um but with women I've seen that like just the th hair thinning that happens that we don't talk about as much because, you know, Saturn will thin your hair. Uh, it'll give you hair loss. That's what Saturn's such a jerk. I mean, you know, I sure. love Saturn, but man, what a damn jerk. Yeah. And, and there was lots of other stuff that happened during my Saturn return, but that was just one of the funny little yeah. things that was like a Saturn transit of, yeah, the, the greatness of Saturn. I could write my own book about that with that theme. With that theme, I would love to read that book. Please right. Do. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Uh, Jaylan, I think this is it. I think we did it. This is an amazing episode. Thank Woo! you so much for joining me for this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we made it happen. Yeah. I really, you actually saved me because I needed to do this episode. I was having some rough transits with like a, a dental surgery like a week ago. And I think we rescheduled twice, but you you bailed me out uh, by coming on and doing this episode today at the last minute. So I really it's appreciate it. Oh, it's um, so my pleasure. And it actually turned into a really amazing episode. So Yeah, it did. Uh, I feel really good about it. Yeah, so thank you and congratulations on the book. I'm really excited for when it's going to come out, which is going to be, you said New Year's Eve? Yeah, New Year's Eve 2019. Okay, everybody should- So if you should... pre-order it now, you'll have it New Year's Eve or you can just buy it afterwards, but then you won't have it on New Year's Eve and you'll cry because your friends have it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so everybody should go out and just pre-order it right now if you enjoyed this episode and enjoyed this discussion. Additionally, if you enjoy this discuss discussion, Jessica has an amazing podcast. Where can people find that? Sure. Um, Ghost of a Podcast can be heard everywhere that podcasts are heard, and it's called Ghost of a Podcast, so you don't have to spell my name. And on the show, every week I answer a listener question. Sometimes I actually like do readings for people live. And in the second half of the show, I do the horoscope for the week ahead. So it's not a sun sign horoscope. I break down the astro the astrology of that week, and I talk about the transits. And through um, my kind of methodology with it all, I, I kind of like essentially model and teach uh, astrology and how I use it. So um, hopefully you will listen to it and like it. And um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was so fun. Brilliant. Yeah. And yeah. you've been ki killing it with the podcast. You've been killing it Thank with, you. you had a Facebook show. And um, is that going to come back for like a second season or how no, is that going? TLC. I, it was a TLC show in partnership okay. with Facebook. And um, they just did the one season. I don't know what their plans were because it was like the mysterious world of the Discovery Channel. Sure. But um, yeah, we just did the, the one season. And uh, 
Yeah, that was, I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to find. I think you can find it on TLC's YouTube page. Um, and then I have episodes on my website as well. Um, if you go to my website at lovelaniato.com under the watch tab, and you can see, yeah, episodes of the show there. It was called Stargazing. And while you're there, you can see like BuzzFeed videos I've done and um, a couple other things, a couple awesome. other like TV-ish stuff. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of content to consume upon my website if you're in the market. Brilliant. And then finally, are you? Do you have any upcoming like speaking things or conferences that people should know about? Ooh, good question. Ooh, mm -hmm. I wish I could remember. Um, okay, I do. I do, and I don't remember. I mean, I'm going to. I'm going to take my book on the road. I'm going to take the podcast on the road. Yeah. I'm going to go to L. A., Seattle, Portland. I'm going to go to New York. And if you want me to go to your city, email me. Um, I also, I feel like there's something else that I'm going to, I have a few other things. I'm going to be speaking at NORWAC, my favorite astrology conference. You are. So you're, you're going to be at, so if people want to see you speak, they can go to the, the Northwest Astrology Conference, which is actually one of our sponsors, which I'll mention and plug at the end of this show Yay. once we're done talking. So you'll be speaking there in Seattle at the end of May, 2020. Yes. And in San Francisco at the International Astrology Day um, event, I will be speaking. That's in March of 2020. Um, right. I'll be speaking on this topic actually. So if you're in San Francisco oh, awesome. and you'd like to celebrate international astrology, then come, come around. Um, and I can't remember other things, but if you're interested in more me, uh, which would be so nice. Thank you. Um, I hope to be doing more AMAs, like ask me anything's live AMAs where I can give more people more, um, answers to questions and stuff like that. So get on my mailing list, follow me on social media at Jessica Lignato. And I'm assuming you're going to leave it there for people to copy and paste because no one can spell my damn name. Yeah, I will put links to everything either on the description page for this episode on the astrologypodcast.com or below the video on YouTube in the description to your website so people can go and check everything out and pre order the book and listen to the podcast and mm -hmm. pretty much everything. Yay. Thank you. Brilliant. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this, of course. I, we appreciate it. Um, yeah. And good luck with the book launch in about a month and a half from now. Thank you. I need it. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think you're going to need it, honestly. But um, yeah, thank you for what you're doing for astrology and for like being on the front lines in so many different ways in terms of promoting good astrology and like having conversations that are important to have while at the same time making it like accessible to people. Like I really appreciate and respect that. So thank you so up. much. Thank you. Oh, that doesn't make me cry. It's very sweet. Thank you. It means a lot coming from you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank All you. right. Thanks everyone for listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast, and we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thanks to the patrons and sponsors who helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through a page on patreon.com including patrons Christine Stone and Nate Craddock, as well as the AstroGold Astrology app available at astrogold.io, the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs at honeycomb.co, and also the International Society for Astrological Research, which is hosting an astrology conference in Denver, Colorado, September 10th through the 14th, 2020, and you can find out more information about that at esar2020.org. And the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening in Seattle, May 21st through 25th, 2020. And you can find out more information about that at norwac.net. For more information about how to sign up to become a patron of the podcast, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Mm -hmm.